friends. I just pressed the let's go live button. You know what time it is. It is Friday. Woo! All right, we made it through another week, but we're not done yet. We've got some business to attend to, but we can't get into it until the tubes are confirmed to be working. And it looks like they are on the YouTubes, on the Rumble tubes, on the Twitter tubes, and of course on the Locals tubes, our friends over there. Let's get started, shall we? Hello, my friends, and welcome back to yet another episode of Watching the Watchers Live, the show that spotlights misconduct involving police, prosecutors, and politicians. My name is Robert Govea. I am a criminal defense attorney, and today we are talking about a judge threatening Donald Trump. In fact, actually sanctioned him. $5,000 fine came his way today, and it's pretty uh, precarious position there. Right, Donald Trump is flying a little close to the sun, as they say. And this was an accident. I don't think this was his fault at all. But somebody on his staff left up a post that was ordered to have been removed. And so the judge was threatening his team today. Trump's defense had to throw themselves on the sword a little bit and say, it's not our fault. It's not our client's fault. It's some staffer's fault. And so some staffer somewhere is having a big problem with this. But this is the point, right? We're following the bouncing ball. We're watching this escalate. And we're waiting for the moment that some judge somewhere says, all right, enough of that already. You're just going to jail. And we're, you know, we're going to see if that happens, if and when. But a $5,000 fine, a threat of jail, a threat of jail for a non-criminal case brought by Tishy Latish James. So we'll go into all that here today. We've also got a little bit of a conundrum in the House of Representatives because they can't figure out what the heck they're doing over there. But we've got some cowardly Republicans, and I don't, you know, use that word um, haphazardly. But we see we see this thing that happens, and I'm so sick of it now, is front stage, backstage stuff. Okay, they come out front stage, and they just tell us a bunch of garbage, and then they go backstage, and they do whatever they do back behind closed doors in the gutters of Congress. And so we see that something like uh, 86 people voted against Jim Jordan behind closed doors, even though 20-something will vote against him in public, okay? So something like 60 weak, spineless Republicans stabbed Jordan in the back behind closed doors, but they won't do it out in public, and so we'll talk about it. Marjorie Taylor Greene said, Jordan's out, he's done, he's thrown his hat in the ring, he's tapping out. We've got him, Jordan, also giving us the statement that we'll run through. We'll see what Kevin McCarthy says. You know, he says this is a pretty big mess that we're uh, about to embark upon. Patrick McHenry comes out, gives us the plan, and we'll hear... From this guy, Representative Fitzpatrick, who hails from Pennsylvania, and he's going to give us an opinion on what should happen to the people who caused all this, right? The Matt Gates and the other eight. And then we're going to talk about the answer, okay? We think we have the answer to this whole house problem here, and I've got it all figured out. It's going to solve the whole problem. It's going to take the argument right out from the Democrats. In fact, they're all going to have to vote for this candidate once you hear my take on this. And so stick around or check out the mind map and click that button if you want to see what the answer is early. But this is where we'll go. We'll jump into the threats. We'll then talk about Kenneth Chesebro, who took a guilty plea today. Oh, and we spent all day yesterday talking about Sidney Powell and really dove into that one. And I thought that was much ado about nothing. And I got to be consistent here. I think this is still much ado about nothing. In fact, I think Big Fanny is letting one slip again. She's letting this one, you know, out. And it's not good for her. I think that we're going to go through it. We're going to skip some of the document deep dive today, jump right into the change of plea proceeding. And we're going to see, right, I'm always curious what these last minute negotiated deals look like. And you're going to see, he did plead guilty to a felony, but they wanted jail time and they showed up and Big Fanny said, no jail. And (laughs) the way that I take this, the way that I interpret it, not even a felony, okay? So the felony is going to disappear. It's going to drop off because it's under the First Step Act. And we'll talk about that. I've actually pulled up the statute today that we'll read through so we can explain how it works. So he's getting no jail and his felony will be dismissed at some point later down the road. It's like, wow, what a smoking deal. And you can tell just by listening to the proceeding that it happened this morning, okay? They worked it all out this morning because somebody really didn't want to go to trial. And in all reality, probably both of them didn't want to go, but we'll go into it. Then we'll wrap up the day by talking about this new revelation for all of the direct evidence. There's no direct evidence Democrats. Direct evidence Democrats, all the deads. All of them are 
apparently going to be uh, still diluted because this check is not going to change a thing because their brain cells don't function appropriately, but you get the picture. This is the picture. It's a $200,000 check from Sarah and James Biden, senior, 200 grand, March 1st, 2018, pay to the order, so from James Biden, the bro, to Joseph R. Biden Jr., that's the president, and it's a loan repayment. <laughs> For a loan repayment. If you believe that. Now we're going to go into this bankruptcy filing that James Comer shared with us because in the bankruptcy filing, it tells us that there's a very interesting chain of custody of this money before it ended up with James Biden. It came from a hospital. That hospital was promised a bunch of crap by James Biden. They want their money back because James ripped them off and paid Joe half of the proceeds. So we'll go into that. We'll also hear from James Comer as well. And so as you can see, my friends, we've got a lot of fun stuff to attend to, and we are excited that you are here and with us. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for liking this video wherever you're watching it. And of course, thanks for considering becoming a member today. We got a lot of cool stuff coming for our members. I'm working on it real hard. In fact, I had a meeting with a friend of mine this morning to talk through a couple of things that were kicking around. And so we're excited about what's coming. We've got a lot right around the corner, like literally like today or tomorrow, I'm going to start sharing some stuff. And then you can join us watching the watchers.locals.com to get some cool stuff. RobertGovea.com is also our website. We've got PDFs now available or over there and it's just happening as it can be. Click here, click the reports section and you can see if there's any documents that you want to read. Like for example, well, I'm not sure. Were there documents here? Let's see. Was it, was it, were there documents on this segment? No, no documents there. But the point is you can go, you can read the reports, read the summaries. This one has some documents and so all the PDFs are being uploaded there with the red lines at robertgovea.com. Now, without any further ado, my friends, let's get into it because we've got some business to attend to today. It's Friday, but there's work to do yet. And it starts off uh, with some people who've been very difficult. Cowardly Republicans go behind closed doors and stab Jim Jordan in the back. Now, we like Republicans who will come out and tell us to our faces why they are voting for something or somebody and what the rationale is behind that. But when they go behind closed doors and they say one thing to our faces and do something differently out of sight, that doesn't feel very honest. And Thomas Massey says that Jim Jordan's out of the race. He says Jim Jordan gave it his all. He was the best speaker candidate to reform the country's spending addiction that's been bankrupting our country. But sadly, today, the GOP conference, they met privately and they ended his candidacy by a vote of 112 to 86. Thomas says, I would have voted a thousand rounds for Jim, as would have many others. But you know, when they were talking about this in public, when all their votes were on the record, there wasn't that 86 that voted against Jim Jordan. We had votes this morning and there was like 25, maybe a little bit more than that, who voted against him. But when they close the doors, when they pull down the curtains, all of these so-called Congress people then change their votes and they decide Jim Jordan's got to go. So that's what happened in Congress. We're going to go through it, hear from Jim Jordan, Kevin McCarthy, Patrick McHenry and others. And we've also got the answer to all this, all right, right under this node. Clicking this button right here is going to reveal the solution to this entire house problem. And I can't wait to share it with you. It's pretty simple. In fact, I can't believe it took me so long to figure it out, but it's the next step. Okay. We know who the next speaker nominee has to be. You can guess along at home if you think you know where this is going, but let's start by seeing what happened as soon as they broke ranks, as soon as they came out of that disgusting closed door meeting where they just decide our fates for us. They asked Marjorie Taylor Greene about this. Hey, uh, Marjorie, can you tell us what the heck happened in there with all these disgusting Republicans? Here's what she says if this will play. Now, why is the audio not playing? Let's see, because we have it muted. We're gonna unmute this tab. Yes, Jim Jordan's out of the race. Uh, what, what happened in there, is Jordan out of the race? Uh, yes, yes, Jim Jordan's out of the race. Uh, we're supposed to come back for a candidate forum on Monday at 6.30. Monday? Yeah. And will that be a long one again, just like last time? I don't have a location for you, sorry about that. But I do know there's apparently something like a thousand pro-Palestinian uh, protesters, pro-Hamas protesters coming this way. So like yesterday's we need to go back. are you thinking of for, the, or that, that, that are being discussed at this forum? Uh, that's, they're supposed to uh, put their name in on Sunday. But nothing in conference was discussed today about that. 
that they're supposed to put their name in on Sunday. Okay, thank you. Okay, so Sunday we're going to get some new nominees. It's not Jim Jordan. It's not Kevin McCarthy, right? It's not Steve Scalise. Who else could it be? Well, we know who it is. We know who the answer has to be. Who's going to solve this problem for us once and for all. But before we get there, here's Kev McCarthy. He's coming out and he's explaining, you know, this is kind of a big mess now. This is we're in pretty big disarray. We were even further every time we voted for Jordan. It was like 20, then 22 against, and then 25 against. Now 80 against? Gosh. Yeah, so you guys um, are going to go home? Yeah. Um, unfortunately, um, Jim is no longer going to be the nominee. We'll have to go back to the drawing board. What history will look at, the crazy eights led by Gates, the amount of damage they have done to this party and to this country <coughs> is insurmountable. I've never seen this amount of damage done to just a few people for their own personalities, for their own fear of what's going through. And really, um, it's astonishing to me. And um, we are in a very bad position as a party. Yikes. One that has won the majority, one that America has entrusted us with, that a simple eight people have put us in this place. So what's going to happen next? What kind of names do you expect to be on the candidate forum list? I don't know. I mean, on a very serious note, this is talking about the person third in line to the presidency. And the furthest step anybody takes is from the front row to the podium. A lot of people here that might put their name in might not have the knowledge of what it takes in others. So I, I hope we, we, we had some other people up for the job that both could have done the job. Uh, I, I'm concerned about where we go from here. Will you get back in? Will you get back in? Yikes. Who could it be? Now, the reporter said at the very end there, would you put your name back in there, Kev? Which is honestly where I think this is all going. I think that we're probably just going to continue to beat each other up for a while, and then they're going to make the, the eight really pay for it. They're going to make Matt Gates and everybody just feel like losers until some of them start breaking back. And I don't know who's going to break, but maybe Mace breaks back, maybe Burchett breaks back, a couple others, and then you kind of have what you need. So we'll see if they can break the ranks of the eight or not. But we did see that Matt Gates and others signed a letter saying that they would accept being censured and other things. If Jim Jordan was the nominee, that's obviously not going to happen anymore. So would they break ranks for Kevin in exchange for not being censured or something else? I, I think they're just going to go back, right? This is all, it feels like this is going to be a lot more performative than uh, not. And they're going to wait until people who may have been uh, in the neutral position during this start getting agitated th at their constituents and start demanding bring back Kev. You know, bring back Kev. There were, there were people who were keep Kev and there were people who Kev, you know, where camp Kev has to go, those two buckets. But there were a bunch of neutral people in the middle. They're like, well, I don't care. You know, Kev's like whatever. And who else, you know, who else do we have? But, but this debate is going to be shaking off some of those people and some of them might just fall right back into camp Kev. I mean, if we can't have better than Kev, we don't want worse than Kev. And we got to have somebody. And they need to spend, man. They've got like $100 billion that Joe Biden just ordered up, and they needed the House to sign off on that. So they've got to get some acti activity here and activity quick. But this is what Patrick McHenry says the actual plan is. And here is his announcement after the House had some problems. Is that good? Hi, everybody. Um, House Republicans will return on... Monday at 6.30 p.m. for a candidate forum, followed by uh, an election process on Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. The reason why I made that decision is we need space and time for candidates to talk to other members. Um, it's fair to say that uh, Leader Scalise wasn't given adequate time. He had 24 hours to campaign. I don't think that was right for him. Our nominee, Jordan, was given a little more time. Not right for him. The conference made a decision that we're going to move forward with a new speaker nominee today. Um, Who? But the space and time for a reset is, I think, an important thing for House Republicans. Now, on the national security front, we have fully constituted committees. Committees can still work, and they are working. Chairman Rogers, Chairman Turner, Chairman McCall, Chairwoman Granger are all working. I want to thank the administration for their briefings on the supplemental request for national security. 
our committees are working with the administration, and the goal there for our committees is to be ready to respond legislatively once we have a duly elected Speaker of the House. And it's my goal to be talking to you at this time next Friday as chairman of the Financial Services Committee. Uh, Hope you all have a great Are you weekend. doing a floor right. vote on Tuesday? Is that your plan? That will be the goal. Floor vote on Tuesday is the goal, he said. That's the goal. So come back on Monday, see if they can hash out another candidate, whoever that's going to be, and then make the vote on Tuesday. But this is interesting because I don't know who they are going to nominate in the aftermath of that, but it's not going to be Jordan, not going to be Scalise, not going to be McCarthy unless there's some consensus for that. And McCarthy made the point, you know, third in line to the presidency. This thing is a pretty powerful position. Somebody competent had, had to be in that spot. It's not going to be Jordan. And so will the eight break? Will Matt Gates and others decide to coalesce around some other moderate or would it be McCarthy again? Here's one guy from Pennsylvania. It's Representative Fitzpatrick. And as we talked about yesterday in yesterday's segment, there are knives out for Matt Gates. I mean, they really want him to pay for this. And if they can shatter the uniformity there, and they might be doing that right now because there was that, that letter that said that Matt Gates posted that, that you know, they're willing to sort of negotiate here, which we didn't cover here, but he did post something. And he's still upset about it. Here's Fitzpatrick from Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah. So you voted against him this round. Yeah. What, what are your thoughts moving forward? Could you ever switch back to Jordan? Now, listen, this, take the names out of it. This has never been about Hakeem Jeffries, Jim Jordan, Patrick McHenry. This is about opening our government. Uh, we have uh, two wars raging. We have a government that runs out of money in 29 days. We have Ukraine running out of weapons in, in two weeks. We have 30 dead Americans in, in Gaza. We have 14 missing Americans in Gaza that we know of. And we have an entire branch of government that's offline. That is unacceptable. So I hope you all are asking the question of the eight and the 208 that put us in this position. Because they are the reason we're here. We're going to try to figure out how to clean up that mess that they caused. But that's why we're here right now. And everybody needs to be abundantly clear that we had a speaker who put a two-party bill on the floor to avert a government shutdown, and he was punished for it. That is the worst message you can send to America. The worst. And every single person that voted to punish bipartisanship ought to be held accountable. Should Jordan Everyone. drop out? That's his choice. You saw how I voted today. It's not McHenry. Is there anybody else you could see getting to 217? With I, that's a question for individual members. I think Patrick McHenry is a perfect person to just get us through the year and possibly the cycle. Oh. Wow. Up the phone and call wow. So he said Patrick McHenry will get us through the year and possibly this cycle. So we have a pro tem speaker for the rest of the Congress until 2024. Are you kidding me? And it's all because of what spending? We got a lot of money to spend. Hey, we got a lot of checks to write. Yeah, I know. I know. It's always that, man. It's always money, money, money. We're going to lose everything if we don't just keep spending. And we have one line of, we have one branch of government offline right now. Does it feel like that at all? Does it feel like one branch of government is off? No, everything is still as messed up as ever. We need all three of them. Well, you know, be careful on that one, but three of them could be uh, working much better. Let's just leave it at that. And some dysfunction in Congress is better than pillaging the treasury for your own ill-gotten gains, right? We're all sick of seeing that. So he's obviously not gonna be coming around for Jordan. In fact, he's in line of just let a pro tem person happen because all that results in is money. But what does that not result in? What do you think a pro tem speaker is gonna do? You think he's gonna bring in impeachment proceedings against Joe Biden? No, that's dead on arrival, man. If we don't have a speaker, it's dead on arrival, right? We have this pro tem speaker who's only gonna pass like essential stuff. Remember that? It's like, what, would, what did they say during the pandemic? Like you're, a, you're an essential worker or something. Remember that garbage? We're like, oh, we're not essential anymore. That's really neat to think about. Thanks for that. So then you have this essential pro tem guy who just only passes through the spending bills and everything else gets left behind. Well, that's the stuff we want. We want the subpoenas to Hunter and Joe and James, as we'll talk about in another segment here. $200,000 check that's got his name on it. And we want the oversight committee and the judiciary committee to to call in their you know, inquiries. But if we have all of this, like in a neutered house, that is much worse than having Kev. Hakeem Jeffries and ask him who I talk to Hakeem all the time. I respect him. Um, I hope he's more bipartisan in the future, but I respect the man. I do. Um, but we talk to our colleagues all the time, okay? 
Thanks. All right, so they're just going to get that money. They just want that money, and they're just going to hide like little weenies behind closed doors and not do what a huge portion of their party wants them to do. Now, we arrive at the answer, my friends. The next speaker, the man who can solve all of these problems here together, and I think you know who it is at home as we play along. Dun, 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 dun. It is Byron Donalds. I think he's the answer, my friends. And why? And first of all, I know what some of you are thinking. You're, some of you are thinking, hey, Rob, he's new. He's like a brand new congressman. You know, he doesn't really, you know, have that experience that he needs. And the first, my first reaction to that, this is what a lot of people on the left are going to say. And my first reaction to Nancy Pelosi is how, Nancy, how could you be such a racist? How could you be so bigoted against Byron Donalds? Because that's what they say anytime we you know, criticize one of their candidates. I happen to think Byron Donalds is highly qualified. And he's somebody who can deliver a good message. He's somebody who's got some conservative bona fides. He can reach across both sides of the conservative spectrum. We've seen him bring the hammer against Joe Biden and the impeachment crime family. We've seen him try to bridge the gap across the moderate wing. And if Democrats don't vote for him, they're bigots. They're bigots. So that's really, I think, another highlight feature there, right? And I'd like to be able to just look right across the aisle and say, how dare you, Nancy? How dare you vote against Byron Donalds? You party, your party has turned into something else, I'll tell you what. And in all seriousness, I really think that there is, you know, some value there. We'll see. I do agree, right? You know, I'm only kind of half being serious, but half not. And this is, I think, one proposal that might be able to catch some uh, momentum, but we'll see. You'll have to let me know what you think about it. I'm really out of ideas. I don't know who else it would be. And I do think that a pro tem speaker is going to be exactly what the Democrats want. Because it, 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 it would result in a neutered Republican Party. It would just be kind of whatever. It's all the things the Democrats want and want out of Congress with none of the bad things. They get no impeachments. They get no you know subpoenas and on and on and on. And so I want to just make sure that we're all aware that I, we don't know who these people are, or what their names were, but there were 86 Republicans behind closed doors who voted against literally a very high, qual highly qualified guy, Jim Jordan, somebody who's been around for a long time, that would have been a good alternative to McCarthy, but they want it all, man, and they want it all, and they're going to try to blame the right on this. It's like the right caused all this problem. It's like, no, you guys were spending whatever the Democrats wanted. Kevin gave them no credit limit. And so now they're upset that they can't spend. Well, we'll see what happens. I mean, I'd like to see some activity from the conservative side. We'll see if they're going to be able to cobble it together. We'll wait and see, my friends. We'll continue to cover. Let me know what you think about Byron Donalds down in the comments below. Thank you for checking out robertgovea.com to sign up for our daily newsletter. And we'll look forward to seeing you on the next one. Yeah, Thomas Massey's great. So Kalupi over on uh, Rumble says, what about Thomas Massey? Thomas Massey's great, but Thomas Massey's just a white guy, you know, you know, so, uh, you know, you don't get that racist bigot line that you get with Byron Donalds and that you could scold the left into that. Listen, I know this is like a racist treating people like trading cards type of a conversation we're having here, but that's what they do. We're just using their stupid tactics against them. You know, I know it feels kind of icky and gross, but. That's true. And, you know, quite frankly, I think Byron Donalds might be down for that. You know, he's kind of a team player like that. I think he might have fun with that. He should, he, I bet he would say it. I bet Byron Donalds would go up there and say, I can't believe, what, Nancy? You voted against me? Wow, what a bigot. So it would be fun to see. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Why not? Let's get into it. All right. Now, we're carrying on, my friends, and we've got some court documents to attend to. And I think we're going to have, yeah, we'll do a, we'll do a sponsor skip in this one, right? So I'll, I'll do a, I'll just do a pause and we'll just skip right over it. We'll do live stream privilege here on this one, but let's get into this one. Donald Trump gets a $5,000 sanction and a threat of jail from judge Angeron out of New York city. We know this is the case that Letitia Tishy James is bringing against him, suing him for all sorts of made up charges in my humble opinion. But now we're going to take a look at the order that dropped from this judge and it involves a gag order. The judge said Trump can't post certain things. He posted something. Trump was ordered to remove it and he did. 
but the removal didn't come down from another location on his website. And so somebody notified the court about it and the judge was furious and you can hear him, not hear him because we can't have tri cameras in the courtroom, but we're gonna see that he was basically threatening the defense with putting Trump in custody, holding Trump in contempt. Here is what NBC News reports. They say, the judge threatens to imprison Trump for violating a gag order in the New York fraud trial. Now, to be honest with you, I think that it's probably a little bit over eager. You know, I'm not sure what they're gonna be able to do with this. Like literally, can they imprison Trump? He's got secret service protection. There's all sorts of really complicated things just in mechanics about this. But it's not that the judge couldn't, you know, revoke his passport or order him to home detention or something like judges have a lot of power to nudge people into compliance in their courtroom when they say people are violating them. And this is one of them. Five thousand dollar fine. And here's what it says. The judge presiding over Donald Trump's two hundred and fifty million dollar civil fraud trial on Friday fine Trump five grand floated the idea of jailing him for defying a partial gag order. Earlier in the day, the judge was livid when he revealed that Trump failed to comply with an order and he raised the possibility of putting the former president in prison happening in court today. Engeron said Trump had posted on his social media account an untrue and disparaging post about his court clerk. And we're gonna read through the order, but he leveled the fine. He said, you better not violate this again. Now, Trump's defense attorney was in court. We're gonna read the official order from the judge himself, which is why we're fast forwarding through this. But Trump's attorney, his name is Christopher Keyes, and he came out and he said, Your Honor, listen, based on my understanding, this was truly inadvertent. He said the True Social post was taken down when the court asked, okay, Trump published it. But True Social was taken down and Trump never made any more comments about the staff, okay, he understood. But it appears no one took it down on the campaign website. This is Trump's lawyer. He says, it is unfortunate and I apologize on behalf of my client. So kind of falling on the sword here. Now, Trump had posted those statements and we saw that he had deleted it, but it ended up on his website, but the judge was still unhappy about it. And so I wanna read through the full order so we can see the extent of this. And the thing that has me most concerned about this type of behavior or this type of conduct from the courts is that it sets a precedent because what we have now is, is a gag order also out of the January 6th case. And every time we get a gag order and every time Trump can't speak a little bit, it's just like narrowing the hula hoop that's around him, right? He's got certain amount of free speech space and wingspan that he has. But every time he gets a gag order, they narrow that wingspan, right? He's less free. They're like closing the walls in around him. And then they create these traps where he could have a sanction for this, right? It's basically a gag order trap where he can say something because he's responding to Mike Pence or he's responding to somebody in the campaign and it crosses the line and boom, it just sets off this trigger point where the judge can now sanction him or even imprison him. And this judge may not do this. Remember, this is just a civil case, but in Judge Chutkin's case, in the January 6th case, that is a criminal case. And that order is much broader than this one. And so if Trump, like for example, has another mistake in this case, the judge is very likely could say, I've already given you your fine. Now you're, you're determined to be in home detention, right? The penalties can escalate pretty quickly. And what happens is I think will, will happen as we've already seen is Judge Chutkin from Washington DC is looking to New York because she looked to New York in, in authorizing her own gag order. She said, well, I mean, he's threatening people over there. That's why I'm justified. And now she's gonna say Trump violated it again. And now, now I'm really justified. So it's just, it's gonna be a bunch of spring-loaded judges everywhere waiting for Trump just to make one minor move, one little mistake, boom, sanction, boom, penalties, boom, fines. He's not allowed to use a cell phone. He's not allowed to get on the internet. He's not, you know, he can't write any posts or something like that. Who knows what they'll do? But they'll do it because they're already doing it. It starts with a fine and it escalates from there. So we're gonna take a look at this full order, but before we get into it, a quick message from our friends. This is the order from Judge Angeron, and now it is going against Trump. Let's dig right into it. You see, this one comes out of the Supreme Court of the state of New York from New York County, and New York is weird. They call their lower level courts Supreme Courts, and they're not. They're, they're, the, the, they're like district level courts. So we're not actually in the Supreme Court as we most know it, which is the highest court of the land. We're actually in a lower level court, but this was filed 10:20 in October 
And you can see the case is the case that we're all familiar with. It's big Letitia James. Her name is Tish James on one of her ex accounts. That's why we call her Tish because she's the biggest Tish in New York. She is the state attorney general after all. And so she's there. The state of New York is suing Donald Trump and the rest of the Trump org people, Eric Trump, Weisselberg, and others. So here's what the judge said, right? This is the ruling that is sanctioning Trump. It says Arthur Angeron signing this thing, and this is the fine. He says, all right. Some time ago, on October 3rd, during a break in this trial, defendant Donald Trump posted to his social media account an untrue, a disparaging, and a personally identifying post about my principal law clerk. And that post was actually saying that I think that the clerk was like the judge's girlfriend or something like that. Or, no, it was Chuck Schumer's girlfriend because the law clerk had been hanging out with Chuck Schumer and she was like whispering into the judge's ear and Trump was getting irritated about this because it's like, judge, are you in control of your courtroom or is somebody else telling you what to do? Because you're the judge, not her. She is the law clerk. And if the law clerk is hanging out with Schumer and she's telling you things, judge, we might have a problem with that. So Trump posts that he says, hey, Chuck Schumer's girlfriend's coaching the judge. And the judge gets a message. Oh, Trump can't say that about my law clerk. She's really smart. She's helping me a lot. Says, I spoke to the defendants, meaning the judge, both on and off the record. So on the records in the courtroom, when everything's being recorded, off the record is usually, it could be either in the courtroom when they turn off the recordings or when they go back into the judge's chamber. He might say, hey, I want to talk to the lawyers back here. Come on back with me. In a case like this, I'm sure that's happening probably every day. Off the record, so not on the record, not something that is recorded, I ordered Donald Trump to remove the post immediately. Approximately 10 minutes later, Donald Trump represented to me that he had taken down the offending post. So do you like how this is working in, in uh, the United States? Donald Trump posts a message, which in my opinion is totally free speech. You may disagree with the content of the message. You may not like the fact that he was belittling a judge, his clerk or something like, I wouldn't recommend that generally. Like it was my client. I'm like, hey, don't call the judge and the clerk names. Okay, just because. But in when I was representing clients and practicing, my clients weren't the victims of political prosecutions. You see that? So I didn't have to worry about that. I didn't have to worry about saying, uh, defending against a partisan political prosecution that was corrupted by politics. So I didn't have to worry about that. So in this case, okay, Trump's only defense to a partisan political hack corruption prosecution is free speech, which is why we have free speech as the First Amendment. Okay, you know that if your institutions of power are corrupted, one of the first things they're gonna want you to stop talking, stop doing is talking about their corruption. So that's why we put free speech ahead of the Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendments, which are generally your criminal amendments, search and seizure, due process, right to counsel. So we put it first because it is that important. And we, we put the one that it talks about guns and defending yourself second, because that's kind of the priority scale. Okay, free speech comes at, at all cost. It, it is the most important thing. So it, still, all that being said, in America, we have one judge in New York City that is presiding over a case being prosecuted by Tish, who tells and lectures the former president of the United States, who's the current, in, in, by many polls, the current leading candidate, definitely for the Republicans, to delete a post of free speech talking about the partisan, in my opinion, corruption that you're watching in the Trump prosecutions. Take down your post. So Trump gets over there, he pulls out his cell phone. He's like, okay, I'm gonna get on true social. All right, your honor, I deleted it. You happy? And Trump promised me, the lecturing judge, that he would not engage in similar behavior going forward. The judge writes, I then, on the record, then I went, we went, we left after, you know, maybe they went back in chambers or maybe this was on the, in the courtroom, I don't know. But he says, I then, on the record, we're back on the record, I then imposed on all parties to this action a very limited gag order, that's what he says, that, quote, forbids all parties from posting, emailing, or speaking publicly about any members of my staff, okay? And that, that is pretty narrow, right? If it's only like his staff specifically, that's fine. It's not even the judge, not Tishy. It's just his staff. Emphasizing quite clearly that personal attacks on members of my court staff are unacceptable, inappropriate. I will not tolerate them under any circumstances. Right, you know, like I get that from a judge. Now, I would still make my argument that Trump is allowed to say that because it is free speech 
And if you're talking about corruption in the courts, you need to be able to talk about the clerks, the bailiffs, the people who take your ticket for parking, right? You got to talk about that stuff. You don't get to just curtail people's free speech when they're making criticisms about the institutions that are in control of the levers of power. That's why we have free speech. It's to petition our government for a redress of grievances against those very institutions of power. Now, again, you might not like it. And, you know, for, like from a perspective, I was the same way. Okay, my law firm, anybody talked to one of our legal assistants badly, even if it was a client. What did you say to our team? No, 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 no. That's not how we do things here. You understand me? So, like, I get that. And I think Trump you know, did, too, because he deleted the message and he didn't do it again. He said, I further made clear that failure to abide by this directive will result in serious sanctions. Now, they say, despite this clear order, last night I learned that the subject offending post was never removed from DonaldJTrump.com. And in fact, it's been on that website for the past 17 days. And so I don't know how they have this set up over there, but I think they have a scraping system. So whatever Trump posts on his truth account you know, gets converted into a post or a blog on donaldjtrump.com. Just like what we do at robertgovea.com. All of our segments are translated into videos. Thank you for going there to subscribe to our newsletter. In fact, that this post had been on the website for 17 days. Now the judge says, I understand it was removed late last night, but only in response to an email from this court, which means that, you know, I think it was an oversight. As soon as they knew about it, they're like, oh, we delete it. So today, in open court, counsel for Donald Trump's lawyer stated that the violation of the gag order was inadvertent, and it was an unfortunate part of the process that is built into the campaign structure, right? That's exactly right. So he tweets or truths, then it just gets carried over. Now, the judge says, and he's going to maybe do it this time, he says, giving the de Trump the benefit of the doubt here, he still violated the gag order. Now, they're giving us a standard here. Okay, they're saying that the standard is, so again, like this is man, this is where we're setting up mines, like literal mines in a minefield. And Trump is going to be tap dancing around this for the rest of the campaign. This is all by design. Watch this. Here's the line. It says, contrary to, this is from another case from 1997. I don't know what court it's from. But it's from 1997 case, maybe some state uh, state case. It says here, contrary to Trump's, this would be Trump's, it's not Trump's case, but let's apply it to Trump. Contrary to Trump's claim on appeal, a finding of civil contempt, like which is what Trump is th being threatened with here, it does not require a showing of willful disobedience. In other words, Trump didn't have to intend to put that thing on the website. The fact that it made it to the website, that's Trump's fault. Doesn't have to be willful, doesn't have to be intentional. It can be a mistake. So if somebody from Trump's campaign takes one of his statements and does a mistake about it, this judge is holding Donald Trump personally liable for it and fining him for it as we're about to find out. So just to be clear, the entire campaign is now on high alert. He continues further, now, whether it's intentional or the result of whatever campaign structure negligence, the effect of the post on its subject, my staff, is unmitigated by how or why it remained on Trump's website for 17 days. Apparently, there was not, it was not that big of a deal because nobody found out about it until somebody was like searching around. Like if she was getting bombarded with threats every day because it was such a threatening message, wouldn't somebody have noticed it, had, it, it was up? No. Now, moreover, Trump may not evade liability for violating a court order by saying that someone else did it, by blaming it on an employee. Trump's responsible. He says, in the current overheated climate, incendiary untruths can, and in some cases already have, led to serious physical harm and worse. He says, Donald Trump has received ample warning from this court as to the possible repercussions of violating my gag order. He specifically acknowledged that he understood and would abide by it. Accordingly, issuing yet another warning is no longer appropriate. Okay, first strike, second strike. What happens next? This court is way beyond the warning stage. 
man, I've been nervous that they're going to try to lock him up or do something. Given the defendant's position that the violation was inadvertent, and given that it is a first-time violation, this court will impose a nominal fine, $5,000, payable for the New York Lawyers Fund for client protection within 10 days of this order. But even though that's tit money for you, Trump, he says, make no mistake, future violations, whether intentional or unintentional, will subject the violator, you, Donald, to far more severe sanctions, which may include, but are not limited to, steeper financial penalties, holding Trump in contempt of court, and possibly imprisoning him due to New York law. Signed, Judge Arthur F. Engeron, New York court. So, you know, I know it's Trump. I know it's a judge. I know sometimes these things, it can feel like we're in a little bit of a circus. But when I read stuff like this, you have no choice as a lawyer, as a defendant. You have no choice but to take it very, very seriously, even if he is the former president. Now, the reason this stuff is such a problem in our constitutional order is because Trump is in my opinion in, in in the movement of America is it's all everything that Trump is sort of fighting for now is much bigger than this political partisan prosecution hack brought by Tishy James in this particular jurisdiction the interest of all of Americans in voting for their favored candidate and that candidate being able to speak and that candidate being able to say basically you know largely whatever he wants within the confines of the law and if he gets gagged, if he gets sanctioned, you know, it's going to cause a head. We're going to have two immovable objects of American civil structure hitting against each other. One is the justice system. One is the democracy electoral system coming like this, which is why we don't do this, which is why in the last 234 years in this country, we've never done stuff like this. Uh, but now we, here we are. And it's because they are so panicked that they are breaking glass in case of emergency. They're doing everything they can to stop Donald Trump from winning including escalating threats, even for a mistake, okay? Even for a mistake, Trump's going to be liable. And Chutkin's going to piggyback off this. And Jack Smith is going to use this as saying Trump willfully violates. And they're going to do what they can to turn the screws even tighter. So we'll be here, my friends, to continue to cover this and monitor this. I do hope you invite somebody to come over here and check out the channel so that they can see what's happening to Donald Trump. They can see and unpack all of this disgusting behavior that's happening around this country in America, censoring our own president and his free speech. Thanks for inviting him. Thanks for subscribing. And we'll see you on the next one. Now, let's jump in to some court activity because this is another interesting one. And this involves Chesabro. Big Fanny Willis loses another one. And that's in my opinion. Now, she does get a felony conviction. This one is involving Kenneth Chesabro. It is a plea deal, though, that is going to, I think, go away. We're going to dive into it. But remember this first offender act. Now, we can't say for certain whether his charges are going to go away because he still is going to be on probation for some period of time. And he could always fail probation or something could happen, which means the conviction will stick. But if all goes well, it seems like Kenneth Chesabro's felony charge will ultimately get deleted. We're going to take a look at the Georgia Code. We're also going to see what happened at the change of plea proceeding because this all happened immediately, very quickly. They were scheduled for jury selection in this case because trial was going to start early next week. But something happened. The parties came to an agreement. And at the end of the day, a plea deal has been struck. Now, there's a lot of interpretations on what's happening here. And previously, we've gone through the Sidney Powell plea deal. And she took a guilty plea that involved not one word of Donald Trump's name in it. Not in the proffer, not in the factual basis, nothing, nowhere, not even in the indictment of the charges. This one's different, though. We're going to hear Donald Trump's name come up a lot in this one. And this one is a felony. And we do have promises from Kenneth, apparently, to testify. So we're going to break this down and see what's happening here. But I still think 
This is not a victory for Fanny. I think that her people were scrambling to give Kenneth a smoking sweetheart plea deal, and he had no choice but to take it. We'll point out when that happens, but let's dig in. All right, parties are getting situated. Judge is calling the prosecutor. Are you ready? Oh, okay. Let's go on the record with 23 SC 188947 versus Kenneth Jesbro. We had begun our jury selection process this morning, but I've been informed that there is a change of plea. Is that correct, Mr. Wade? That's correct, Judge. Is that correct, Mr. Grumman? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Now, this Nicholas Wade is the guy that I think was connected to Fanny, and he's getting he's the special prosecutor who's getting paid big money to come and prosecute these cases. I think he had a relationship with Fanny as a mentor or something. Negotiated? It is, Judge. All right. And in that case, whenever counsel are ready, uh, and wherever is most convenient, uh, Mr. Chesbro, you can stay seated, use that microphone or that microphone, but uh, we could swear in Mr. Chesbro and proceed with the colloquy. You want me at the podium, Judge? Or? Well, I think he's going to take the podium, oh, so why don't we have you there? Sorry. You stand right here. Okay. Probably need you where we can we can hear you. Oh, oh did we really? Yes, okay. I can stand. Can you hear me from here? Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. So we got Judge, would you like me to now. give you the conditions of the sentence or the recommendation? If it's, if it's negotiated, I think we can just start at Both the top. Okay, got it. Thank you. Mr. Chesbro, can you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give should be the truth and the whole truth, so help you God? Yes. Please lower your hand and state your true and correct legal name. Kenneth John Chesbro. And are you the Kenneth John Chesbro named in the indictment 23SC188947? Yes. Are you under the influence of any drugs, alcohol, or medication today? No. Is there any medication that you should be taking that you have not taken today? No. How old are you and how far did you go in school, sir? 62, I went through law school. Are you able to read, write, and understand the English language? Yes. Have you gone over the indictment with your attorney, Mr. Grubman, as well as Mr. Aurora? Yes. Do you understand that you were originally charged in count one with RICO, count nine, conspiracy to commit impersonating a public officer, count 11, conspiracy to commit forgery, count 13, conspiracy to commit false filings and writings, count 15, conspiracy to commit false filing filing false documents, count 17, conspiracy to commit forgery, count 19, conspiracy to commit false statements in writings. Yes. Okay, a lot of charges there, right? Including RICO. And we went through this in depth with Sidney Powell, it, but it's the same thing, okay? Whole slew of charges, meaning a bunch of them. She just listed, I don't know, half a dozen of them. And they're all getting dismissed except one. Do you understand that the state has a, that this is a negotiated plea, and as part of that agreement, the state has agreed to null pros counts 1, 9, 11, 13, 17, and 19, and will be moving forward on count 15 only? One only, yes. so dismissing six. Has your attorney one. advised you of the minimum and maximum sentence for count 15, which is conspiracy to commit filing false documents? Filing false documents. They say Chester Burrow was the guy behind the alternate electors plot. Yes. And do you understand that that carries a minimum of one year to a maximum of five years to serve? I do. Do you understand that you have the right to plead either guilty or not guilty to this charge? And if you plead not guilty or remains, or if you plead not guilty or remain silent, you may receive a jury trial. Yes. Have you reviewed the waiver of rights form with your attorney? I have. And have you um, signed it as well? Yes, I have. Along with Mr. Aurora. Yes. Judge, if I may, court. Have you had enough time to speak with your attorney, Mr. Aurora and Mr. Grubman? Yes. Have you had an opportunity to talk with them about all the facts and circumstances regarding the charges in the indictment, including your potential defenses? I have. Do you need more time to discuss your case with either of your attorneys? No. And are you satisfied with their services? Yes. Mr. Grubman, all do right, you did wait? You, did you see that? Did you see his, his facial expression? Okay. Now, what we like to do when we listen to these is back out and see how they got here. Okay, remember, this is like a pressure cooker situation. And maybe I should have framed that out a little bit better here. But we've got juries, like there are jurors sitting outside this courtroom. They're about to pick them. And they've got trials starting on Monday. 
Okay, so they are like, it is tense. Government probably does not want to go to trial, but they don't want to make that known. The defense really probably doesn't want to go to trial, but they don't want to make that known. And so everybody is scrambling and negotiating to try to figure out how can we plea this thing out. The judge too, because the alternative on this is a six-week trial. And you know how expensive that is for everybody? You know how much that costs the government to haul in juror after juror and then have them sit there for you know six weeks, pay them for that, and then have Fanny's office on this case, special counsel Wade Smith, all the witnesses being brought in, not to mention the opportunity cost. So then Donald Trump's team is going to get to see everything. And Giuliani's team is going to get to see everything. And it's going to be a big disaster. So Fannie doesn't want it to go, I'll be honest. And the defense probably doesn't want it to go because he probably thinks he's going to be convicted on at least one of them on something and probably get some jail time. And so, but he's, he's like racing till the day of trial, like the day of, man, they're picking the jury today. And watch his face when they ask him, are you satisfied with your attorney? Okay, it's a great question. He goes, Oh, yeah, actually, his eyes, his eyes go up like, yeah, they got me a smoking deal. And I'm going to explain because I watched some clips of this earlier. But I, there's a, a segment in here where it sounds like they showed up today and the plea deal was jail time. OK, the plea deal was three to six months of jail. And now it's no jail. In fact, now the felony is going to be dismissed as well here because they're going to be prosecuting this under the first uh, Offenders Act. Wait. So here, let's watch that one more time. Reading the other end. And are you satisfied with their services? Yes. yes. Mr. Grubman, do you waive formal reading of the indictment? Yes, I am. Do you waive any and all defects that may lie within that indictment? Yes. Mr. Chesborough, have you um, been arrested on these charges that lies in indictment 23SC188947? Yes. The state is unaware of any outstanding warrants related to these charges. Do you or your attorney know of any outstanding warrants that involve these charges? No. No. Do you understand that this is a negotiated plea, which means your attorneys and the state have reached a negotiated recommendation to make to the court? I do. Do you understand that the court is not bound by that recommendation and could sentence you to the maximum penalty for the charges? I do. Do you understand that the recommendation in this particular case as to count 15 conspiracy to commit filing false documents is five years to be served on probation, a $5,000 fine, and that you are, I believe you're asking the court to treat you as a first offender. Is that correct? Yes. Yep. So they'll get first offender treatment, five years probation, $5,000 fine. And we'll see what the first offender act allows him to do. I'm sorry. $5,000 restitution. Restitution. You understand that? Yes. And do you understand also special conditions of the probation is that you commit complete a hundred hours of community service? Yes. And that you write an apology letter to the citizens of the state of Georgia? Which I have, yes. Yes, and that you truthfully testify at all hearings and trials involving co-defendants in this matter, that you have no communication with co-defendants, witnesses, or the media until all cases have been resolved against all co-defendants. Yes. And do you understand that you... So he already has to testify truthfully. We'll see if anybody wants to question him uh, or interview him as a co-defendant. But the media one, I can understand that one too. You must give a full recorded proffer with the state okay. that you continue to also provide documents and evidence subject to any lawful privileges asserted in good faith. Yes. And you're on. Okay. So look, you're going to hear a lot from the people on the left. He's testifying against Trump. He's going to give him everything. He's agreeing that he's going to testify and honestly and openly like they're going to, I already read all of it. He promised he has to do that anyways. If he's called, you know, and now he, now he can testify, right. Without being worried about incriminating himself. So he can testify and he's not going to be giving over stuff that, is privileged to the government because he doesn't have the right to waive the privileges between Trump or Giuliani or whomever because the privilege holder are the people on the other side. So he can't give them certain things because he, he doesn't have the choice to breach that privilege. Trump would, and Trump is obviously not gonna do that. So I'm not really sure what they're gonna get. Now, we're gonna listen to her proffer and they've got Trump all over the place in this one. So yesterday, Sidney Powell's attorney I don't know how, but kept out Trump's name from everything. That doesn't happen in this case. We'll continue. I mean, the defendant has already sought, done an apology letter, which the state will tender into evidence. The state's exhibit number one. And also this morning, Mr. Chesborough, along with counsel, um, did give a proffer to the state. And I believe there is an understanding that any outstanding emails, text message, or any of those things will be turned over to the state in timely manner. Indeed, yes. 
Text messages, Mr. Chesbro, do you understand, as I stated before? Text messages, emails, all of that stuff will be turned over, but not the privileged stuff that, that would be between him and his clients. If the judge does not follow the recommendation, you can withdraw your guilty plea and go forward with trial. Yes. Do you understand that this is a guilty plea, which be which, well, for your case, you're asking for first offender. So once you have completed first offender, you can honestly say that you have not been convicted of a felony. And I'll go over that with you a little bit more. Did you hear that? As long as you complete everything, you can honestly say that you have not been convicted of a felony and you won't have a conviction. Okay, she wasn't that clear about that yesterday when we were hearing this with Sidney Powell, because they probably had already talked about that. But she was clear about it this time. If you complete everything, you can honestly say you are not a convicted felon. So it's like a diversion program, okay? He does his community service, he pays his fines, he spends five years on probation, and he is not even convicted. The felony disappears. Why are you not seeing that in the headlines anywhere? And it's gonna be the same for Sydney, by the way. So rather than saying that all these people pled guilty to what? A disappearing charge? That's gonna be diverted at some point anyways? It's literally gonna be dismissed? Here, l listen to her say it again. Yes, I understand. Honestly, for your case, you're asking for first offender. So once you have completed first offender, you can honestly say that you have not been convicted of a felony. And I'll go over that with you a little bit more. Yes, I understand. How is that a win for Big Fanny? Okay, she gets $5,000, she gets 100 hours of community service, she gets a proffer. She, now she's trying to gather some evidence against Trump, maybe that's her big victory, right? Lose these cases to go get the big one. Like you could see how that would go. But this alone is, it's a fail. So is Sidney Powell's. They're not even gonna end up with permanent convictions. And do you understand that this- If I'm a defense attorney, which I am, and if I, if I were practicing again, that would be a tremendous victory to go from seven felonies to zero? Are you kidding? This plea may be used to enhance sentencing on any other convictions you may have in any other jurisdictions in the state of Georgia or outside of the state of Georgia and in federal courts. Yes. Do you understand that you are being placed on probation as part of this plea? As being on probation, you cannot violate any criminal laws of any governmental unit or any special conditions of the probation. Do you understand yes. that? Do you understand that if you violate your probation or any other special conditions, you will be subject to revocation of the balance of the sentence? Yes. Do you understand that you are not allowed to possess or use firearms as a result of this plea and where you're on probation? Yes. Do you understand that if you are not a United States citizen? Little different than Sydney's because he is on, a, on felony probation. Sydney was not. Listen, this guilty plea could will affect your immigration status and will resort in deportation, just like a conviction at trial would, and that this is truly is true regardless of any advice your attorney may have given you or anyone may have given you. Yes, fortunately, I, I am. Do you understand that you that there may be other adverse or unfavorable consequences as a result of this guilty plea, just as there would be for a conviction after trial? For example, your guilty plea may affect your right to vote, your right to hold public office the right to, to serve as a juror, the right to obtain a passport, the right to receive, possess, or transport firearms, the ability to obtain employment, and your membership of any state or federal bars of which you are a member. Yes. Do you understand that by pleading guilty, if you use, receive, possess, transport a firearm, or use a firearm in a crime, you will be guilty of a felony, which may carry a sentence of one to 15 years? Yes. Is my understanding you're asking the court to treat you as a first offender? Is that correct? It, it, correct. Yes. Have you gone over the First Offender Act with your attorneys, Mr. Grubman and Mr. Aurora? Yes, I have. Okay, so let's pause right there and let's take a look at the First Offender Act. Not a heavy statute. We can go through it relatively quickly, but I wanted to show you how this works because this is the same thing that happened to Sidney Powell. And it's pretty generous here, honestly. Here's what it says. Probation prior to the adjudication of guilt. So... Think of it this way. Think of like they're holding this guilty plea right now. Okay, he's going through the paperwork. Yes, I plead guilty. Yes, blah, blah, blah. And they're just going to hold on to it. Like they're not going to enter it into the record. I mean, it'll be entered into the record, you know, somehow. But like it's not going to be a guilty conviction. And they're just going to hold on to this thing. Now, if Chesterbro or Powell, if they go out there and they insurrect an election again or something, right? They break the law again. Then, then they don't need to do anything with this old case. They've already got their guilty plea. They just say, oh, well, you broke your probation. You've already pled guilty. You said you wouldn't plead. You said you wouldn't break your probation terms. Now you have, therefore you're guilty. 
Okay, so you don't even have to uh, adjudicate it. It's just done. You're convicted. It's over because you, we made a deal and you broke it. And this is a good way to have something that hangs over a defendant's head rather than just saying like, you can also, you can also give somebody diversion before they plead guilty. Just say, okay, well, we're just going to give you the benefit of the doubt now, but then you have nothing to hang over their heads. So they're doing that right now. They're saying, look, when a defendant like here, Chesabro, has not been previously convicted, the court may upon a guilty verdict or plea of guilty, but before an adjudication of guilt and without entering a judgment of guilt and with the consent of the defendant, all of these things are true, defer the further proceedings. Okay, so kind of put the whole thing on hold for a while while they're completing probation and then place the defendant on probation. Now, the court has to review the criminal record prior to them going through this process, but when a court imposes a sentence, they've got to make some notations about it, and then they've got to, they, they can also limit the case, right? This is where I think we're seeing the sealing stuff come in. So the case gets sealed immediately. Now, the court may then turn around and adjudicate the guilty plea, so now that thing that's kind of being held out you know, over their head, the, the court can turn around and say, yeah, look, you violated the term of your, your deal. So if you get, now you're just convicted, right? We don't even have to have a trial. We don't have to go through a change of plea proceeding. There's no negotiations. I can just sentence you as guilty. Now, this is the, this is the key point. If you are a defendant in this case, like Chesterbro or Powell, a defendant's sentence pursuant to this article shall be exonerated of guilt and shall stand discharged as a matter of law as soon as they complete the terms of their probation, which includes the time of the sentence passing. You see that? As soon as they complete probation, they are exonerated of guilt. So Fanny's not even going to get a conviction. Do you understand that? They won't have a criminal record at all. He's got one charge and it's going to go away. It's going to disappear. <laughs> All right, let's go back to them. And they know it here. Have you ever pled guilty or NOLO to or ever been convicted of a felony in the state of Georgia or any other ju jurisdiction? No. Have you ever been sentenced for any crime, felony or misdemeanor under the First Offender Act? No. Has your attorney explained fully to you the First Offender Act? Yes. Do you understand that if you violate the terms of your first offender or commit a new offense while on first offender probation, your first offender status could be revoked, you could be adjudicated guilty, and you could be resentenced up to the maximum sentence for each for the charge in this indictment for which you are pleading? Yes. Do you understand that you waive any and all defenses, including any mental health defenses, by entering this guilty plea? I do. Do you understand that if you went to trial, you would have the right to trial by jury? the right to see, hear, and confront witnesses called to testify against you by the state, the right to testify or remain, remain silent and not incriminate yourself. Do you understand that? I do. Do you understand that this guilty plea, you are giving up that all of those rights, the right to a trial by jury, the right to remain silent and not to incriminate yourself, the right to confront witnesses, the right to, of assistance of counsel hired by you or by, appointed by the court if you could not afford one, the right of the presumption of innocence, the right to testify on your own behalf or to present evidence on your behalf, the right to subpoena witnesses and compel the production of evidence, and the right to have charges against you being proven beyond a reasonable doubt, and the right to appeal if you were convicted after trial. Do you understand that you're giving up each and every one of these rights by pleading guilty here today? Yes, I understand all that. Has anyone forced, threatened, or promised you anything for you to enter into this guilty plea? No. It is your decision to waive these rights and enter into this guilty plea because you are in fact guilty. Yes. How do you plead to count 15 conspiracy to commit filing false documents in indictment number 23 SC 188947? Guilty. Have you and your attorney signed that indictment? Yes. That's the original felony the count and the original and indictment. <clears throat> Is your guilty plea freely and voluntary given with full knowledge of the charges against you? Yes. Do you understand that you only have a limited right to appeal this guilty plea? Yes. And do you understand that you would have four years from today's date in order to file a habeas corpus petition challenging the voluntariness of this plea? I do. And your honor, the state has um, 
In fact, checked and confirmed that Mr. Chesbrough does not have any felony convictions at all, so he has no, no criminal history to the state's knowledge. If this case were to go to trial, the state would have shown the following. Okay, so this is the factual basis, right? This is the proffer. And yesterday it was very, very uh, absent of one particular word, right? Donald Trump, the name Trump didn't show up one time in Sidney Powell's exchange. And I think that it's probably because Sidney Powell's lawyer was able to keep it out. Okay, it wasn't in the original indictment and Kenneth Chesterbro was part of an indictment that had Trump's name, right? The different overt acts, the different counts and Sidney's was not. But this is a little different, right? We're going to hear Trump's name a lot in this because Kenneth was much uh, more connected to him. So let's listen. Between November 18th of 2020 and January 6th of 2021, the defendant and co-conspirators, Donald John Trump, Rudolph William Lewis Giuliani, John Charles Eastman, Ray Stalling Smith III, Robert David Cheeley, Michael Roman, and others entered into a criminal conspiracy to cause certain other co-conspirators, including David James Schaefer, Sean Micah Thrasher Steele, and Kathleen Austin Latham to falsely hold themselves out as the duly elected and qualified electors for the president and vice president from Georgia following the November 3rd, 2020 presidential election. The objections of objectives of the criminal conspiracy included the following. One, to recruit certain individuals to falsely hold themselves out as the duly elected and qualified presidential electors from Georgia. Two, to create false electoral college documents including a false certificate of vote purporting to have been made by the authority of the duly elected and qualified presidential electors from Georgia. Three, to falsely state that co-conspirator Donald John Trump had won all of, the, all of Georgia's electoral college votes. And four, to deliver those false documents to the Georgia Secretary of State, the Chief Judge of the Northern District of Georgia, the Archivist of the United States, and the President of the United States Citizen being the Vice President. Okay, so there's a there's a distinction that I want to make here. We are hearing the name Donald Trump a lot, but that doesn't necessarily mean that Donald Trump is connected to this conduct. Okay. So just to be clear about that, it's a, I know it's a nuanced point, but it's true. In other words, Kenneth Chesebro could have been doing a bunch of Trump related stuff, not at the direction of Donald Trump. He could have been working to get the alternate electors to go and, you know, sign off on behalf of Donald J. Trump and all of this was, you know, done in Donald Trump's name, but that doesn't necessarily implicate Donald Trump, right? Donald, Tr like they still have to make that connection that he's some sort of, he's involved in this racketeering case. And by the way, he's not even charged with racketeering. It's now, now they've dropped that down to this conspiracy that apparently was done on behalf of Donald Trump. But we're asking ourselves, like, what is he going to say that implicates Donald Trump specifically? in a knowing criminal violation. I'm still skeptical, let's go. The purpose of creating these de and delivering these false documents were to disrupt and delay the joint session of Congress on January the 6th, 2021. By using the false documents from Georgia and other states in an attempt to cause Vice President Michael Pence to violate the Electoral College Act in the United States Constitution. Is there an eye in there? This was part of a multi state criminal conspiracy to unlawfully overturn the results of the November 3rd, 2020 presidential election in favor of the co conspirator Donald John Trump, who did not win that election. Specifically pertaining to count 15 of the indictment, federal laws require the Electoral College documents are maintained in multiple places, including the United States District Court and where the electors met and cast votes. In the Northern District of Georgia, electoral college documents are maintained in the clerk's office, administrative staff with other non-case related documents, including standing orders and orders from the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. Document maintained in the administrative safe are public records that can be inspected by members of the public and members of the public can request certified copies of those documents that contain the clerk's official seal. Overt acts committed to affect this object of the conspiracy included, but are not limited to the following. One, the defendant created and distributed false electoral college documents to individuals in Georgia and other states in coordination with Donald John Trump for President Inc. Also okay, so again, right, he 
coordinated with Donald J. Trump for President Inc. We're asking about that. Like we're trying to we're trying to follow the chain up to Donald Trump specifically, not the campaign. Donald Trump's knowledge, and you know they're going to make the case that Donald Trump was running the campaign and he should have known and all and all the things. But we're we're following these connections very closely because we're trying to anticipate what Chester Bro is going to say or testify to. And the government will come back out. The reason why these factual bases are, are appropriate or important is because they're going to point back to this. They're going to say, on the record, you admitted that you were part of this. Right, right, right. What do you say to this now? And if he says something like, it, like I didn't do that, they're going to say, we, we just read through the whole thing in court. You agreed to it. Also known as the Trump campaign. The defendant provided detailed instructions to co-conspirators in Georgia and other states for creating and distributing these false documents. Three, co-conspirator Donald John Trump and John Charles Eastman solicited the director of the Republican National Committee to assist in recruiting persons to serve as fake electors in Georgia as well as in other states. Co-conspirators Rudolph William Lewis Giuliani solicited persons to serve as false electors and provided strategic instructions to several co-conspirators concerning the execution of the conspiracy in multiple states. Five, co-conspirator David James Schaefer, Sean Micah Thrasher Steele, and Kathleen Austin Latham and others met at the Georgia State Capitol in Fulton County, Georgia on December the 14th, 2020, created false electoral college documents that falsely stated that the co-conspirator Donald John Trump had received all of Georgia's electoral college votes and delivered those false electoral college documents to Congress and other governmental entities. The co-conspirators also attempted to deliver a copy of the false electoral college documents to the Northern District of Georgia for the purposes of filing, entering, I object to the whole uh, plea because I don't know, is there such a thing as electoral college votes? I thought it was the electoral college votes. So I'd be like, Your Honor, I don't know what she's talking about. I've never heard of electoral college votes. It's just, does that exist in America? And recording those documents in that court, having reason to know that those documents contain materially false statements that the co-conspirators were the duly elected and qualified presidential electors of the state of Georgia. The defendant was personally also personally present on the grounds of the United States Capitol during the disruption and delay of the joint session of Congress on January the 6th. That would be the factual basis for this plea, Your Honor. Anything else to add, Ms. Young? Okay, so Nothing. there's a lot there, right? That was a lot meatier. Now, if you were with us yesterday when we were talking about Sidney Powell, right? That hers was like a paragraph, okay? That was a whole thing. That makes me a lot more nervous than Sidney Powell's does, right? Sidney Powell's was like, uh, Sidney Powell's was like really buttoned down. It's like, she maybe did a thing sometime somewhere, very small, limited. It was like, they're, they're not going to ask her anything, but that had Donald Trump's name all over the place. And so it would be very important to parse through that and see what you could extrapolate from there and how that might be hurtful to Trump. From the state. Is there any recommendation from the state on a behavioral incentive date, which I believe would have to be imposed in this sentence? The state has no issue with that, Your Honor. We understand that, that it, it will be as such. But what, what term would you recommend? Three years. All right. Mr. Grabman, are you in agreement with that? Yes, Your Honor. Just to clarify for the record that give. Now, listen to this. His five-year probations, probation sentence is going to be more like three. Been, um, good behavior and following the rules and the statute that Mr. Chesbrough's probation would terminate after three years. And are you requesting immediate sealing, Mr. Grabman? Yes, sir. All right. Is there anything else that you'd like to add on, on to the record, Mr. Grabman? I would just like to thank the court, Your Honor. I know this has been a strain on court resources and a strain probably on your patients. And I know from time to time, I may have been one of the people that caused that, but thank you for your patience. And I, I really do appreciate it because um, I think the court's done a great job and um, we appreciate it on behalf of Mr. Chesborough. Okay, so that that is a defense attorney who's thrilled that they got this done. Okay, very excited. He knows that, well, not, you know, not excited. He's very, he's thrilled. It's a great job for his client. So this is a victory from his perspective. And he's just thanking the court because they've got jurors sitting outside ready to go. And, and by the way, just to be clear, in most, in most, well, I can't say most, but where I practiced a lot, if you waited until the day of trial to get a plea deal and the government's case was good. So like, let's say for example, in the DUI case, right? The government has generally has pretty good cases in DUIs because they just turn them. They're like big, you know, money makers for them. They have it all, you know, rigged for them to win. 
So they know that, right? So sometimes they'll give you your best plea deal at the very first setting, and then as you get closer to trial, the plea deal gets worse. When the government's case is bad, the plea deal gets way better on the verge of trial, and they just negotiated. Now, let's listen. Let's listen. Well, uh, Mr. Grumman, there's no need to thank me. We are uh, here to give everyone their day in court. So I hope that's what we've been able to accomplish here today. Uh, Mr. Chesbro, I have a, a few uh, questions for you, sir. Do okay. you understand the remaining charge against you? I do. And you've heard the rights that you would give up by going forward with this plea. Do you still wish to uh, waive those rights and proceed? Yes. And are you pleading guilty today because you agree that there is a factual basis that supports this remaining charge? Yes, this charge. Mr. Grubman, are you satisfied your client is competent in understanding that the plea is voluntary and that there is a sufficient... Did you hear what he said? This charge? So, so... You know, I'm not, I'm not sure on it, but the factual basis that she read, that big, long paragraph, a lot of that might have nothing, zero to do with his charge, which is why I was kind of listening, you know, that might be overbroad, right? So they might say all of that and they come back in and they say, oh yeah, but you did this and this and this and this. He says, no, I didn't. I mean, I didn't plead guilty to that. I didn't plead guilty to that either. I pled guilty to this thing and that's the conduct that I admitted. And what you said in that factual basis, it's way overbroad, right? It, it, it encompasses that little subset of conduct, but I didn't plead guilty to all that crap that you said. So that's why I was kind of curious what this defense attorney did. Like if he, you know, did they sit down and redline that? Was that a part of the negotiation? Did he say, yeah, sure. Like did, did Tishy say her office, we'll give you this diversion deal where your felony will go away, but we want a very meaty proffer. Like we want a factual basis that's just filled with Trump, Trump, Trump. And that might, that might lead me to believe that maybe he's willing to testify against Trump, right? But we don't know. But what he said right there was, yeah, only for this charge. And he's a lawyer. He knows he's not stupid. He knows that she just went on a little rant and rave, but whatever, that's fine. She can do it. But he's only pleading guilty to one thing, not seven and not Rico. Factual basis. Yes, your honor. And there is one thing that I was looking over um, to my co colleagues um, we have an agreement. Uh, I believe that this, the state will agree this does not constitute a crime of moral turpitude. That is correct, Your Honor. All right. Crime of moral turpitude, we explained on the Sidney Powell plea, but that is a crime like dishonesty. You're trying to defraud somebody. So they're going to say conspiracy to file false election documents, even though it's a felony, it's not a crime of moral turpitude per the court entry. It's not one of those crimes of dishonesty. And it's going to be dismissed. Mr. Chesbro, have that in the in the sentencing sheet. That would be great. Thank you. Understood. And I, I hear that that is without objection from the state, and so consistent with the other resolutions in this case. We'll include that on any final disposition form. Uh, Mr. Chesbro, do you have any kind of a weapons carry license uh, in the state of Georgia or elsewhere? No. All right. Well, I agree and find that there's a sufficient factual basis for the charges as proffered by the state. And I find that this plea of guilty is knowingly, voluntarily, and intelligently entered. Uh, Mr. Chesbro has asked to be sentenced on the First Offender Act without objection from the state. And I'll approve that request with full adjudication. Uh, but I must notify you, sir. You hear what he said? We're going to withhold adjudication. Not going to be convicted. The plea can't be withdrawn simply because you don't abide by the terms of the sentence. And the terms of that sentence would be as recommended by the parties on uh, the sole count, 15. Uh, the sentence would be five years probation. Uh, there would be payment of $5,000 of restitution to? State of Georgia. All right. State State. All right, and that will be um, later clarified through probation and the uh, on reflected in the final disposition form. And Your Honor, we will provide that information to probation as to exactly who that payment needs to go to. Understood, and, and as we've done before, uh, the specific language of these Special conditions as agreed to by the council. If you could email the, us to those, we'll make sure they're reflected appropriately. And your honor, sorry to interrupt, sure. but Mr. Chesborough does live in Puerto Rico. So to the extent we could recommend to the probation office that his probation be transferred there, that up. would Listen. obviously be convenient. <laughs> that might complicate things. Uh, we do have our uh, representative from probation here today, Ms. Pretty, uh, who is usually able to enlighten us on these kind of complications. Um, Ms. Pretty, any thoughts uh, when we have someone who's in one of the U.S. territories uh, under supervision? That I would have to contact the supervisor about him being in Puerto Rico and how that transfer would happen. Normally in other states, we would just do paperwork for the ICOTs, 
and he would contact the officer, but this is in another area. So if you give me five, 10 minutes, I can get the supervisor on the phone and find out. Okay. So uh, the meaning to suggest that this would be something. No, I understand, Mr. Grumman. Let me ask this. Is Mr. Chesbro planning to leave Georgia today Listen. or was he planning to stay here at least for a few days? until we sorted things out. Yeah, he was planning on staying here for, for three to six months. So. I would think so. Oh! <laughs> Today, I thought he... Okay, did you hear that? Is he planning on leaving here today? No, he was planning on staying here for three to six months. Okay, his plea deal was jail time when they showed up today. They wanted six months jail from Fanny's office. Okay, he was prepared. He was ready to go. That was the original deal. In fact, they were thinking about taking that deal is what I would guess, a three to six month deal. And that attorney, shout out to this attorney and this defense team, see they're smiling here. They wanted three to six months and he said, we're not taking it. We're not taking three to six months. Give us a no jail plea and give us a diversion or we're going to trial, all right? That's some good lawyering right there. Give it to us or else we'll bring the jury in. And they say, we don't want to bring the jury in. As long as your client pleads to one felony, we'll dismiss it, the whole thing. <laughs> Amazing, right? So it's those little things that you catch. And so you know now, they wanted jail. Okay, they were trying to bluff this thing. That's how you know they fell. Okay, so Fanny dropped it. Okay, she lost this one. They won, which is why they took this deal. They didn't, they didn't cave, Fanny caved. This is Mr. Chesbro planning to leave Georgia today or was he planning to stay here at least for a few days until we sorted things out? Yeah, he was planning on staying here for, for three to six months. I would think so. Yeah. <laughs> today, I thought oh. he was most likely and you could- And sorry, three to six months of trial time, okay? That's also the trial time too. Speak up on this topic that you were gonna probably leave today or we can- leave uh, No, I'm, I'm perfectly willing to stay for three or four days to be around to handle the logistical elements of this. No okay. problem. All right. I think then. Okay. So just to be clear, so that three to six months could have been about the trial time too. It might not have been about the jail time. I could have been wrong on that. I might've misread that, but here, let's. That that's what we have to do to go forward on, on the plea today. We'll finalize it. And then as we learn from probation, what logistically needs to happen to have it transferred. No, it's the, it's the, it's the jail time. We can, usually that takes some time, but I think uh, we'll see what we can do. And if there's any kind of a modification we need to do in order to address these concerns, we can take that up after the, the plea has been finalized. So. Okay. Yeah. It's the jail time because the trial is not going to be a three to six months trial, right? So they were, they wanted him to serve jail three to six months. They, was, what I'm guessing was, is this was an open-ended plea deal. So they said, your client can plead guilty, but we want three to six. We'll leave it up to the judge. And you can have that. You'll say you three minimum, six max. We'll leave it up to the judge to pick it. So three to six months is what he was prepared to do. For a six, in, in you know, a trial would be about six weeks is I think what they were saying. So I was thinking maybe the, maybe he was planning to be there for the trial for three to six months, but I, I don't think so. I think it's for the jail time because his trial would have been about six weeks. So they showed up for a plea, three to six. He gets a plea for zero, smoking deal. Um, we'll follow up with you on that. Was there anything else, Mr. Grubman? Nothing, Your Honor. Okay. I yeah, just wanted to thank you for... Uh the way you've handled these proceedings. Uh, well, I appreciate it, Mr. Chesbro. We're not done yet. Uh, I've still got some special conditions, okay. um, which is that you uh, will have to complete 100 hours of community service. Uh, you, as recommended by the state, would have to write an apology letter, which I, you've already uh, handed to the court and satisfied. Uh, you're to testify truthfully in any other proceedings in this case against uh, any and all co-defendants. Already had to do that. And that you're to have no contact with any members of the media, any co-defendants, or any potential witnesses. And that you're to uh, provide a full proffer in any all relevant documents to the state, which again, the state has said that you have satisfied. Uh, the case would uh, be immediately sealed under first offender. There'd be a behavioral incident date of three years. So just... Sealed, case is sealed. If he's on good behavior, three years is the limit he's off probation so it's not even five years and then the case will be dismissed incredible uh having now formally declared the sentence on the record was there anything else that um miss young you think i neglected to add or that we need to have on the record i don't believe so your honor okay all right mr grubman nothing your honor all right good luck mr chesbro thank you so much thank you honor. oh boy that is good stuff that's pretty funny so we see 
no jail. And it sounds like they wanted jail at that very end moment. We saw he was planning to be there for three to six months. Woo. Now he gets no jail time. So that's a pretty big victory for Kenneth Chesterbro. And anytime something like that happens, anytime you see all those last minute things happen, it is an indicator in my mind that Fanny doesn't have the goods. She's got plea deals for three people. None of the charges will stick, at least for Sydney and Chesterbro. They will not be criminal convicts at all. They will not have felony convictions. They will not have misdemeanor convictions. So what did she get at all? Now, what she has gotten is some cooperation and some silence out of them until the next election, right? Three years on probation for him, five years for, or six years for Sydney. That means that they're gonna be kind of out of the pocket for a while, which is of course what they want. So Big Fanny, in my opinion, loses another one, okay? She's supposed to have all these people dead to rights and she's not even gonna get convictions out of them, pathetic. We'll continue to cover, my friends. Thank you for inviting somebody over here to join us. As we continue to cover this case and more, we'd love to see you join us at robertgovea.com as well. So you can sign up for our daily newsletter, get all these stories delivered right to your inbox, and we'll see you on the next one. All right, now my friends, let's get into our final segment on the day. This one involves our demented criminal president. New evidence of a direct payment to Joe Biden. A lot of people on the left have been saying, where's the evidence? Well, here's one version of it. It's a giant check for $200,000 drafted on March 1st, 2001, paying to the order of Joseph R. Biden Jr. And look at this here. It says loan repayment. And where's this money coming from? His bro, James Biden Sr. Check number 6171 for 200 grand. Man, that's a lot. And so we're gonna talk about exactly what happened here. James Comer made the announcement from the Oversight Committee. And the question is, where did the money come from? Where did it go? What was it for? What did Joe Biden do to get it? Well, here is what Comer says before we get into the filing that explains in more detail exactly what happened. Here's Comer. This summer, Joe Biden said, where's the money? Well, we found some. We're still digging into evidence subpoenaed from bank accounts belonging to Hunter Biden, the son of President Joe Biden, and James and Sarah Biden, the brother and sister-in-law of the president. A document that we're releasing today raises new questions about how President Biden personally benefited from his family's shady influence peddling of his last name and their access to him. Bank records obtained by the House Committee on Oversight have revealed a $200,000 direct payment from James and Sarah Biden to Joe Biden Ooh. in the form of a personal check. Here's some important context about this check we've obtained in our investigation. In 2018, James Biden received $600,000 in loans from AmeriCorps, a financially distressed and failing rural hospital operator. According to bankruptcy court documents, James Biden received these loans, quote, based upon representations that his last name, Biden, could open doors and that he could obtain a large investment from the Middle East based on his political connections, huh. end quote. That's weird. On March 1st, 2018, AmeriCorps wired a $200,000 loan Woo. into James and Sarah Biden's personal bank account, not their business bank account. And then on the very same day, James Biden wrote a $200,000 check from this same personal bank account to Joe Biden. James Biden wrote this check to Joe Biden as a, quote, loan repayment. Huh. AmeriCorps, a distressed company, loaned money to James Biden, who then sent it to Joe Biden. Even if this was a personal loan repayment, it's still troubling that Joe Biden's ability to be paid back by his brother depended on the success of his family's shady financial dealings. Some immediate questions President Biden must answer for the American people. Does he have documents proving he lent such a large sum of money to his brother? Yeah. And what were the terms of such financial agreement? Did he have similar financial agreements with other family members that led them to make similar large payments to him? Yeah, how long was the term and of the loan? And did he know that the same day James Biden wrote him a check for $200,000, James Biden had just received a loan for the exact same amount from business dealings with a company that was in financial distress and failing. The House Oversight Committee will soon announce our next investigative actions 
and continue to follow the money. The bank records don't end here. There's more to come. There is more to come, and we have the entire bankruptcy filing that unveils what's happening inside. But before we dig into it, a quick message from our friends. And this is the bankruptcy filing. Now you can see those two organizations that James Comer was talking about, one of those was called AmeriCorps Holdings. And AmeriCorps Holdings is in the middle of this bankruptcy. You can see this document right here. And it is against, they're, they're filing this one document against James Biden. And what they're asking for is to recover the fraudulent money. Okay, so AmeriCorps is going through bankruptcy. They're going through this accounting. They're, where'd all our money go? This one's in the Eastern District of Kentucky. And somebody somewhere finds this transfer, okay, this trustee, this woman, Carol Fox, she's the person who is winding down the assets of AmeriCorps Holdings, selling stuff off. And she says, well, I found this transaction that says that a lot of money was given over to James Biden. And in fact, this is what the check looks like. You see it drafted here. And it is listed Joseph Biden Jr. and sent over by James Biden, also with Sarah listed at the top. Now they got the bank account numbers redacted, 6171, March 1st, 2018. Joe Biden is not in office at this time, okay, Donald Trump is. 200 grand, 200,000 and zero zeros, and it's for loan repayment, right? You can see that. Now a lot of this loan repayment stuff is just garbage, it's just to hide money from the IRS is really what it comes down to. And they say, no, it's a bad loan or write it off, you know, it's, it's just, it, you put loan repayment rather than cash for corrupt deal. You know what I'm saying? So that's what the check looks like. But this is where it came from. Now, Carol Fox is the trustee. So bank business goes through bankruptcy. They're, they assign a trustee. She's like a fiduciary. And she's got to go and find out where all the money went. How do we go bankrupt? So she's here. Now, AmeriCorps is a debtor. And they see here, everybody now, AmeriCorps, they file this complaint against James Biden. That's the president's bro. Stating the following, they say, this court has jurisdiction. We're in the right location. We're here in bankruptcy court. And they say that AmeriCorps is a for-profit business. They never had direct ownership interest in these rural hospitals, all right? We had rural hospitals all over the place, St. Alexius Hospital. L and, and by the way, the Bidens are like ripping off hospitals, by the way, as we're gonna see. Elwood City Hospital, Izzard Medical Center, Pineville Medical Center, including Lee County Medical Center. Now they say, upon information and belief, the trustee says that James Biden is an individual and a Pennsylvania resident. They tell us, that on December 31st, the debtors, AmeriCorps, filed this petition for bankruptcy. And we entered into an agreement to point, appoint our trustee who's gonna go track down the money. We've done that, her name is Miss Fox. Miss Fox is now in charge. They say, all right, I've done our investigation here. Now, on June 12th, 2018, AmeriCorps Health wired $400,000 to James Biden's PNC bank account. Okay, 400 grand to the president's bro. January 12th, we remember the check was on March 1st. So the money goes into Joe, to James's account in January. That PNC bank located in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The documentation evidencing the wire transfer, you know there's wire transfers uh, notes, it says loan. Okay, so that's curious. Why is James Biden getting a loan from AmeriCorps Health for hospitals? What does he need a loan from them for? Are they in the loaning business? Probably not. Now on March 8th, check that out, the same date as the check. So 400 grand comes in in January. Then they transfer another sum of $200,000 to James's bank account, once again located in Philly. The documentation evidencing the foregoing wire also said loan. Okay, so another 200 grand came in. Now, a couple months later on June 4th, another sum, $10,000, goes into the JP Morgan Chase, different bank. This one's in New York. The documentation evidencing that wire transfer was also prepared by AmeriCorps Health, and it references consulting and marketing, May 2018. So, right, she's the trustee, she's going through all their books. She's like, gosh, she got, she got spreadsheets coming out the wazoo. 
and she assembles this little chart here. She says, okay, here's a $400,000 cash payment. What, what, who, for what, software? What is this, like new equipment? Did you like buy a new you know, doctor or something, like as a salary? What did you do with this money? Here's another one, 200 grand, and another one for $10,000. She's trying to figure out where it all went, 610 grand in total. Saying that, that we have the actual correct documents attached. Now, they say, let me tell you, court, about defendant's relationship with the hospital, talking about James Biden. Says, by information and belief, James procured $600,000 in loans from AmeriCorps Health. This is from the trustee writing this. And it says, based upon representations, like why he got that money, he made representations that his last name, quote, Biden, right there, could, quote, open doors and that he could obtain a large investment from the Middle East based on his political connections. You see how that goes? So the hospital was trying to get him to go get them money. And so they were paying him to do that. He was going to use his last name as Biden. And this is, this is the trustee that's filing this, right? This is not like some like Republican. Okay. Here, let's see who signed off on this document. All right. Gary Friedman, the attorneys, and Frank Terzo, the attorneys for the trustee. See that? So this isn't like the oversight committee. This is a, a filing, by the way, that happened in 2022, in July. Okay, so there's a whole separate person that has identified a whole separate business and $600,000 that was trading on the Biden's name. Now, debtors even provided James, the president's bro, with business cards saying that he was a principal with AmeriCorps Health so that he could go get money. So he's like a financing bundler. A redacted copy of his business card is now attached. Then, as a result of this, they say that he became a fiduciary. So when they put him on as a principal, that means he's got a duty to this company. Like he's got to bring them what he says. He has to care for them, like he would be caring for his own company. But instead of uh, complying with his re responsibilities as a fiduciary, he helped the debtors procure an ill-advised bridge loan from a hedge fund, right? So like when you're a fiduciary, you should be treating it as it's like your own. So defendant helped them get a bridge loan, probably from some other hedge fund that was, his, it was also probably paying him. And it had a del deleterious effect on their financial affairs, right? Probably put them in there like 30% interest and ultimately forced them into bankruptcy. James Biden, was gonna swing in here to save these people, these hospitals, stole their money, got them a bad loan, and now they're bankrupt. And he never delivered the promise of the large investment from the Middle East. What a piece of work, this guy. Hospitals. And worse, the defendant, James Biden, never repaid the loans to AmeriCorps Health incur including during the time when they were strapped for cash. Can we get that loan back? Nope, never got it. Just took the money and ran. Which if you lived in an actual country, right? You might with a, a functional justice system, maybe the FBI would like to look into that one since they're not looking into anything else. Now, despite trustees demand Defendant has still failed and refused to turn the transfers to the trustee. $200,000 loan, I'm sorry, $610,000 loans stolen, not paid back. So count one, this, this trustee, who is the fiduciary of this entity, who's gone through all of their bank records, is now making these allegations. Says within two years of the petition date, AmeriCorps Health made transfers to the defendant the transfers constituted a transfer of an interest in AmeriCorps in their property, and AmeriCorps has received less than the reasonably equivalent value in exchange for the transfers and was insolvent on the dates that the transfers were made, was engaged in a business transaction, and that these debts would be beyond their ability to pay. So they want 
this court to enter a judgment as it relates to Biden, James, declaring that the transfers were fraudulent transfers, avoiding the transfers made to the defendant as fraudulent. So, you know, declaring them either exempt from the bankruptcy proceeding, like they count or they don't. Disallowing any claim that the defendant may have against the debtor. Okay, so he can't come claim that he, he he's owed money. And requiring the defendant to repay the transfers plus interest. So James got to pay that money back and grant other relief that may be proper. They say here, now we're incorporating all of these other in documents. They say here, James also received $610,000. They were characterized as loans. Now, it, that 600 grand is the property of the estate, and they're entitled to the return of that. So please enter judgment against James, 600 grand plus interest, anything else that you deem proper. So these guys are the biggest pieces of work, right? He's like promising people things and then bankrupting them. And probably, I, you know, I bet he was double dipping on this. I bet that when he took this, these people to the hedge fund, he probably took some points on that. Like he probably got paid a portion of their loan to them at the high interest rate. And it was just, and then they go bankrupt and he's like, well, I'll just keep the money. I just put them into bankruptcy and I just absconded with their money. So here are some of the wire transfer documents, 400 grand right there, PNC Bank, Philadelphia. Here's the name, James Biden, right there, sent over to him from AmeriCorps Health. AmeriCorps Health is the originator. Here's another one for $200,000. 200 grand there. The loan comes in. So he's trading on the Biden's name. He gets his 600,000. Look what they did. They put him as the principal. They made him official. AmeriCorps Health. Jim Biden. So when he goes around and he's like doing deals and stuff, he says, I'm working with them and I can get them loans from the Middle East. So he's trading on his uh, brother's name, okay? There is no James Biden name without Joe Biden, okay? None of this exists without him. Saying that he was gonna deliver large loans on the back of his name. There is no Biden name without Joe Biden. So another disgusting discovery and the $200,000 went right to Joe Biden on March 1st, the same day that that transaction occurred. You see how that happens right there? Look at that. March 1st, cleared, $200,000. Joe Biden gets the same check March 1st, 2018 for $200,000. And what James is selling is not possible without Joe. You see the nice little grift that they've got going on? So they're busted and there's gonna be a lot more to this. And I'm curious if Joe Biden, if his response to this is no, I actually did give him a $200,000 loan and he's just repaying that back. Certainly we'll see that somewhere, right? Should show up in the taxes or your bank accounts somewhere. And it should be very easy to clear this up. All he's gotta do is show us when he made the loan to James, my guess is he didn't, it's money. It's the Biden crime family grifting off their power and they're trading on America's interest for their own personal gain. Now, we'll continue to cover it, my friends. Thank you for joining us as we do. Thank you for inviting somebody to join us on this channel or sharing a short video with somebody and say, hey, check out this lawyer, this you know, weird guy in Arizona. Come and join us. We appreciate you subscribing and liking this video and we'll look forward to seeing you on the next one. All right, my friends. Now, let's take a look at what you have to say about this. We covered some good ground. Biden, 200 grand coming in from James. Chesabro gets a pretty dang good plea deal, in my opinion. The judge threatens Trump with a $5,000 fine and jail. And the Republicans turn their backs on James, uh, Jim Jordan yet again. And so now, my friends, let's hear from you and see what you have to say about all of this. A reminder that you can go over to robertgovea.com. Sign up for our daily newsletter. Click here for instant access to the mind map. All the PDFs are here. You can also sign up to the newsletter that will be delivered to your inbox every day. We have all of our reports are on the website now with PDFs available when they are necessary. 
and we're working on some other cool stuff. We'll look forward to seeing you there and also having you join us at watchingthewatchers.locals.com, which is where our membership, our members community, only community exists, and it's where we'll be going as soon as we're done here for our members only after party. We also do Saturday streams. We do morning shows. We already had a stream this morning, and we'd love to see you there, watchingthewatchers.locals.com. But to get us started, we had this one come in from our morning stream. This one came in as soon as we ended from Facts Matter. It says, here's for a laugh and a couple costume. Do you know what this one is, folks? Ice, ice, baby. Boom, 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 boom. That's it. Shout out to Fax Matter and Ice Ice Baby in the house. All right, in the house. Good to see you, Fax, and that's a fun costume. It's Halloween time, my friends. You know where this is going. All right, let's see who else we got. In the house, Fax Matter, getting us started on the day. We've got Dolphin Fan is the man, bringing in five new members. What's up, Dolphin? Bringing in Michael K., Sweet Tats here, Deborah M, Carol R, and Peter R in the house, all courtesy of Dolphin Fan is the man on this lovely Friday. Thank you, Dolphin, for bringing the membos in. We've also got the good doctor, the NY in the house, says without a speaker, impeachment cannot be reported to the Senate. It's a block against impeachment. I know the whole stinking plan is thrown to the wolves. Not good. MAGA Hats Day says, Byron Donalds wasn't a part of the insurrection because he had just assumed office, so it's perfect. Hey, we got to vote for Byron from MAGA Hat Stays. We'll see. We'll see. Maybe he can do it. Hey, this one's from MAGA Hat. Says, net worth $15 million, annual income $4 million, other income $3.9 million, salary $103,000 per year. Should this be investigated? Man, I don't know what Letitia's bank accounts look like, but I'm sure they are fuller than they should be. Pope Rackets Touched Me is here. Oh no, again. Says, when did we have two wars? Glad the U.S. is a priority. Well, you know, everybody else's war is our war. It's just amazing. It's like there's always wars that we're involved in. We have to be involved in all of the world's affairs because we have defense contractors that need to grift off the tax cattle known as the American people. But I'm not mad about it. Pope Rackets, what's up? Thanks for being a member for four months. We're halfway to a baby. And put some cream on it. NY Renal says, I mostly agree with your stance on the Trump gag order. However, judges' infallibility in matters of contempt and the unfairness of the process, in matters where the judge should be recused, his own staff, he has infallible powers to punish. Uh... Yeah, I don't think a judge ever has infallible powers to punish, but I understand the, the instinct to defend your staff, is, is maybe how I should have put it. But I, I, I understand your point and why it's a good one. This one from Knox. What's up, Knox? Says TGIF, Robert, more DA admonishments. I would inter alia take umbrage when they ask my client if he is competent. <laughs> I would agree with you. And so Knox, on, Knox is over on Locals, and Knox is another attorney from Texas. And we were talking about, on our after party yesterday, we were talking about uh, how the, what we, what we listened to were, were the admonishments where she says, you know, anybody prom promise you anything? Are you doing this of your own free will? Are you on drugs or alcohol? Can you read or write English? How far did you go in school? Did you knowingly, voluntarily, intelligently, all that stuff, right? And so I was saying that I would be irritated if my client was being lectured by the prosecutors like that. Mind your business, you know. Because in Arizona, the judges do the admonishments. So what we heard that back and forth from the prosecutor and Chesabro, in Arizona, that's done with the judge. The prosecutor doesn't do that. And same thing in Texas. And so Knox is making a funny joke here. Said, I would take umbrage when they ask if my client is competent. What? What did you say to my client? Turn around, mind your business. That's how I feel. Don't talk to my client. Yeah. And like, there's a big problem. Like, there's a big problem with this. Okay. Like if this has happened, not to me, but it happened to a colleague and a, and a prosecutor got in big trouble with this in Arizona, the, the defense. So there was like an empty courtroom prosecutor, defense attorney, and a defendant were in there. 
And I only heard about this. It didn't happen to me, but this prosecutor got in big trouble. But the defense attorney stepped out, which maybe wasn't a good move, but stepped out of the room to make a phone call or to pick a phone call or whatever. And the prosecutor started talking to the defendant, like started, you know, you should take a plea because like your case is not good. Like my witness and said stuff and holy moly, like that's like a no go, right? You do definitely do not do that. So it turned into this whole thing, like the Arizona um, defense bar went nuts because we all knew the prosecutor who was in uh, one jurisdiction, I almost said it, but like it turned into this big thing. And that's the, like, that's how triggered that lawyers get. Like when you're, when you're, if a prosecutor were to talk to your client, it feels like kind of like your girlfriend, but like times a thousand, you know, it's like, don't you even talk to her. Don't even look at her. All right depending on how your relationships are, you know, I don't know. All right, what's up, Knox? Good to see you. Thanks for being a member. Says, Tasadika is in the house. What's up, Tasadika? Says, I wonder if he or Powell could have pled no contest. They, they might have been able to do it like technically, but I don't think that Fanny would have allowed that, you know, and they got good plea deals. So she, she wanted a guilty plea. Like the headlines are all guilty plea. Guilty, 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 guilty. But they're not going to be convicted and that's what anybody cares about but they got the headlines they need. So, you know, I think it was a victory for the defendant. Like if you're, if you're a defense attorney and your clients are getting smoking deals like that, you are hard pressed not to tell them to take that man. Cause that's a good day. We've got this one from quantum thug life, quantuming it out in multiple dimensions in interdimensional space time says is bringing in five new members. What's up quantum bringing in Poe boy, bringing in old drill sergeant, bringing in Danny M C A M and knowledge tracker, all courtesy of quantum. Thank you, quantum. Stay safe out there in the dimensions. MAGA hat says they had to throw in Donald J. Trump quote, who did not win the election. <laughs> did you hear how they always do that? That's how you know it's just not real. It's like anytime they say illegal and unprovoked invasion, you always go, well, maybe it was provoked. You know, when they say it was, um, when they say that there was no evidence of widespread voter fraud, no evidence of widespread voter fraud, no evidence, right? Then you just go, oh God. So there's fraud everywhere, right? That's exactly right. So Donald Trump, who did not win the election. Okay, keep telling yourself that there, Fanny's office. Hopefully it's a good one. <laughs> Doc says, well played on the electoral, Robert. I was losing my mind on that one. Yeah, your honor. I, look, I don't know what my, I know that my client, was involved in electoral ballots, okay? But here, they're talking about electoral ballots, and I have no idea what the heck those are. Therefore, my client is innocent. Thank you, Judge. No further questions. All right, we're done here. Good to see you, Knox. It was funny. It was like, what was she doing? <laughs> here, Mega Hat says, three to six in Fulton County, bed bug hell. Hell hole. Yeah. They wanted three to six. And he may have been considering taking it, right? Wow. This one from this old guy says, I personally think the state needs to hire a probation officer in Puerto Rico, LOL. Well, Miss Pretty was in there. Miss Pretty was over there. So she'll be able to figure it out. Maybe she'll go over there. What's up, this old guy? We got Tony Hay Munkets says, can Trump's legal team call Sidney Powell and this guy as a witness? Yes. Just curious. I don't think Fannie is going to call either one of them to be a witness. I think they're just trying to spin this guilty plea. I agree. Yeah, so Trump's team could absolutely call call them or subpoena them if needed, but uh, they could absolutely call them. What they testify to is going to be a different story. I tend to agree. I don't think that Trump was it would call them necessarily. Like, I think Trump's strategy is going to be to just not really present much evidence and probably appeal it, but we'll see. Now, I... I agree with you. I think they are trying to spin a guilty plea. I think all of these have been bad for Fannie. They, they are celebrating it, but they, they're going away. They're not even convictions. And Fannie's not even in the courtroom because she's embarrassed. What's up, Tony? Hey, thanks for bringing in the Membos. We got Tony Hay bringing in L, Patty, Pablo C, Craig B, and Gay is coming in the house. All courtesy of Tony Hay Muckets. Tony, thank you for being here. Thanks for the donos today and for being a membo. We got MAGA hat says, what is up with Angeron's signature? Do you know a handwriting expert? Oh gosh, what did he, what did that look like? Here, I didn't even really pay attention to that. Let's see. Oh, oh, I know what he's doing. 
Oh, this guy. He's one of these people. You see what this is? It's an A for Arthur. Then this is the F. Okay, so he's got like he's got like an F coming out of this. Okay, so like this makes the F. So Arthur F Angeron. That's the E. So here, let me do that again. That's he, you know, he's one of these clever guys. So he's doing Arthur F Angeron. Kind of like that. Like that's the E. Right? See how that's going? Yeah. Yeah. Cool, Judge. Very cool. Yeah, you're neat. How much time do you spend on that? Great job. All right. So, all right. So that is what we've got over on the, we got a couple other donos coming in. We've got Lasco is here. What's up, Lost Cause? Lost Cause 3000's here. What's up? Welcome to a supporter, Membo. We're grateful to have you here. And hey, so new members, grab the Telegram link on YouTube. Grab the Telegram link. Navigate over to the community tab section. Download the Telegram link and join us for the members only after party, which is where we'll be going here in just a few short minutes. This one from MAGA Hat says, Rut Row. The endorsements keep rolling in. Larry Elder says BLM leader stands behind J6 prisoners and endorses Trump. That's what I'm talking about. Welcome aboard, my friend. Welcome aboard. There's going to be a lot more of them. A lot, a lot of people hopping on the Trump train. It's going to be good. Woodchip Bill's here. What's up, Woodchip? Over on local says, here's a dono for my comment. Good job, Rob. Fun stuff. Thank you, Woodchip. Thanks for being here. I'm glad you're having some fun. We're having fun. I know it's kind of messy out there, but we still got to have some fun here as we learn and navigate. Just Cause says, Lord be with all, a blessed weekend is needed. Indeed. Just Cause, thank you for that. Nice blessing to all of us and to you, Just Cause. And thanks for modding down the fort for us, my friend. I appreciate it. Hey, we got Christian Fellowship. Rob's in the house. Says, Judge Angeron wants to jail Trump or something because the truth posted, pointing to a post regarding the judges and the court reporter was still on the Trump campaign website. Yeah, we. it seems like, Rob, you may have joined us a little bit late, but we covered that in the second segment today. We read through the full order, and it's in there. But thanks for being a member over on Rumble, and thanks for flagging that for us. So, yeah, if you missed that, if you're joining us late, we covered that full thing in the segment up above. And so check that one out. Hit that rewind button. Good to see you, Rob. And Woodchip Bill says, here's a dono for my comment. Thanks, Woodchip. Another one says... How do you gift memberships? So on locals, there's a uh, on locals there's a button on the sidebar that allows you to gift members, but you could like gift a year or like a three month or something like that. And then on YouTube, you know I actually don't know how you do it on YouTube. Um, that I actually don't know. I actually don't know how to do it. But some people know how to do it. So I think it's just in the app. You can just go and gift Membos. I don't think I can do it on my own channel. Can I? Like when I try to gift here, like I don't have the option to do it. Uh, but some people do. Good question. I really don't know. I don't, I don't know how they do it. Magic. They're magic. I don't know how they do it. But all right. That's from Woodchip Bill. We, we are grateful for everybody who does gift the Membos. Ask Dolphin Fan. Ask John McGarvey. Ask Voice of the People. They're big gifters over there, and we're grateful for it. Let's see who's over on X. Let's see who's on the X platform. We have a Watching the Watchers community on X, by the way. So if you want to go and connect with other watchers and follow other people and make connections on the X, sometimes I know it's hard to jump in on social media. And so if you want to connect with other watchers, we've got a community to do it. And we encourage you to support each other out there in the wild because that's where we're at. We're in the jungle these days. How many people are joining us over on the X? Oh my goodness. We've got some comments and we've got six viewers. That's almost to 10, which means we're about to break the entire platform. We've got the first one from Fred Pedamonte says, in connection with this pretrial diversionary program in Connecticut, it's called accelerated rehabilitation. After probation, all the charges go away. I used it when I was 22. Well, glad you had it available, Fred. Not everybody does. We have something very similar here in Arizona. Uh, but we call them diversions or deferred prosecutions, all sorts of different things. Danny's here. Says, I want to see a Republican nominate Pelosi. 
then the Dems have to either vote Jeffries or Pelosi. Oh, Nelly says, I presume that's why he made up an appeal for a hundred billion last night. Wonder will that will end up. Will Donald be in the mix for the next speaker? We don't know. And, oh, did I mix up my tissues and my fannies today? Oh, Nelly says, I think you mixed up your tissues and your fannies. I get them confused. There's, there's, they're, they're, they're complicated. I mean, they're both the biggest in their respective states. So it's hard to keep track. You know, it's just like two giant op- immovable forces. Charlene, what's up? Says, great show. We got Buff, Buffy Chetty. Says, three or four babies deep with you, good sir. Whoa, we got three or four babies together. Buffy Chetty and I, and, and here, the, the show. All the way back from the show of an era. Man, cheers to you and all the watching the watchers peeps. That's definitely two or, that's three or four babies for sure. Because that was like 2020, man. That was summer 2020. Man, good to see you, Buffy Chetty. Thanks for being here. And apparently Phil Reno says the judge issued a stay on the gag order. And I think I did see that in the chat. Let's pull that up real quick and see if we can hit that and see what happened with Judge Chutkin. Oh, here it is, and it's very short. So we can read it. Upon consideration of the motion for stay pending appeal. Okay, so Donald Trump filed a motion for stay pending appeal, and it's probably long. Yeah, so maybe we'll cover that on Monday. But the judge granted it, and... uh, That's very good. That's very good. That's very interesting. So Trump filed a motion for a stay. Judge issued the gag order. They said, hey, we're going to appeal this. Don't enter it. And the judge agreed. Upon consideration of the motion for a stay, it is hereby ordered that the court's gag order is stayed to allow them to brief. Says the government shall file any motion by the 25th, which will be next week. Good. All right. Now she might be, I think it's pretty standard stuff. I don't think that she's going to reverse herself or anything. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's going to the appeals court. So it's going to be stayed while it's at the appeals court for now. Yeah. All right. We'll see. Anyways, that's good news. So the gag order out of January six, out of the January six case is currently temporarily stayed. Wow. Pretty amazing. Hey, um, John was sharing a button that looks like this, and I don't know if that, I don't see that. So you guys, that's what it looks like from John McGarvey. And then when you click it, this is what it costs, man. Look at all those donos. So that's why we're so grateful for all of our membos. We know you guys, you know, it's, when you get a membo, people are dropping some serious coin to share those membos, man. And that's why we're so grateful for it. So Shout out to everybody who shares the membos, right? It's pretty expensive, and so we're grateful for that. But this is what it looks like. Your gift will be announced. Lucky recipients that are selected by YouTube will get a one month of access to perks. And I don't know why that doesn't show up like in my, it doesn't show up on my channel. Like I can, I just don't have the option. Anyways, thank you for that one. John McGarvey in the house, always gifting membos. Tammy, what's up? Says Tammy been a member for three months. Thank you, Tammy. One third of the way to a baby. It says, bless you for all that you do. Great takes as always. Thank you, Tammy. And bless you. Thank you for being a member and supporting us. We couldn't do it without you. Would not be able to do it, literally. But for you and your help. So we're grateful for that. Another one from Husky Mom is here. Says, for another show, well done. Thank you, Husky Mom. Yeah, today was an interesting day. We had some good stuff to talk about today. And we're glad that you got to join us for it. Tony Hay Munkett says, I can't stand the Democrats, but do you agree that the Republican rhinos have screwed us more than anyone? Well, the problem with the Republicans is you expect them to be better, you know? It's like, you know the Democrats are going to be just communists, and you're like, all right, now they're communists. Like, you expect them to screw you, and so you just deal with it. But the Republicans are really where it hurts, man. And when they're like, what really hurt on the Kev thing was the debt, was the no debt limit. Like they didn't raise the debt limit to go from like a gazillion to a bajillion more. Like it didn't go from those. It was like, it goes from a bajillion to just whatever. There is no limit up for a certain period of time. And you're like, how is that even a thing? They pushed it all the way until after the election. And it's like, wow, 
Yeah, that like I, I wouldn't have even fathomed that. Like I wouldn't have even expected that from a Republican House, right? I wouldn't have even contemplated that. But McCarthy delivered that. You're like, wow. And the Republicans all got on board for it. So yeah, they screw you pretty bad. This one, what's up, Rocky Water, says, dang, I got pulled away by a darn customer. You know, customers, man, they're such a, you know, minus their, you know, patronizing your business and everything, kind of a pain in the butt. But says, I miss one half of the show, but I'll catch up later. But good stuff once again, Rob, much appreciated. So one meatball shout out, if I may be so bold, please. We love good meatballs here. Oh my goodness, Bon Giovanni's, the Italian restaurant on the mountainous outskirts of San Diego. So if you're a San Diego bro or, or gal out there, listen up. Great meatballs, great salad dressing, but horrible salad, which is a bummer. It's on uh, Old Highway 80, El Cajon, California. If you're driving in from Arizona to San Diego, mark it down, meatball fans. That is all peace. Rocky, thanks for the lovely share, man. And I like this concept. I think people should share more meatballs and more meatball suggestions because it's really like the most perfect food, if you can think about it. It's really, it's really got kind of everything you need in there. You put a little pasta in there. It's your proteins, your carbs. And if you want to, you know, if you want to like add some vegetables, you know, you got a salad in there, which is a good thing, but you get the point. We're talking about spaghetti and meatballs here, meatballs. So I appreciate the suggestion. And next time I'm heading out to San Diego, maybe I'll have to try it. But good to see you, Rocky. Thanks for stopping by and hopefully you enjoy the rest of the show when you get caught up over there. But my friends, that is it for us on the day. Wait a minute, we had another couple over from X. Old Drill Sergeant is here, says here to give you a viewer. What's up, buddy, says LR Customs. O'Nelly says, ah, Byron Donalds, great choice. Buff Chetty says, been admiring your work since the old last name days. Thanks for what you do, yeah, it's been a while. And George is here, says, hi, it's Georgia Peaches. Byron Donalds is in the house from Carol. What's up? And LR Custom, we got a lot of comments over here on the X today. Says the, the Floyd autopsy is also part of the scheme. They started this even back then with the, yeah, the George Floyd stuff, the guy who had arterial sclerosis and uh, clogged arteries. Yeah. Yeah, and so, you know, they, they use the legal system as a cudgel against all of their opponents. So, great comments, my friends, over there on the X. Thank you for sharing those. But we are going to wrap it up there. Members on YouTube, join us on Telegram, which is where we're going to hang out for a little bit. Locals, friends, hang tight for a minute or two, and we'll be back. If you would like to join us at watchingthewatchers.locals.com, we'd love to have you. We've got Saturday shows in the morning. We do streams in the morning during the week. And so if you're looking to say hello and say good morning to a community, that's the place to do it, watchingthewatchers.locals.com. And we really try to deliver for our members. We try to, I know some people will start groups and just kind of forget about them, but we try to actually provide actual extra content regularly. So come and check it out, watchingthewatchers.locals.com. Want to say thanks and shout out to the mods who help keep the show nice and orderly all week long. Thank you to our friends, John McGarvey, Donut Mind Me, Dog Digger, Janek, we got 909, John Allen's here, Zach Nichols, Beyond Geo, Zulu, Ronnie Cole, Playing Hooky, Just Cause, K Bean, and of course, Vienticus Prime in the house, all modding down the forts for us. Shout out to our meme smiths, Jigam Gigam, Sleepy Dog Lee, and Nathan NA10 for memeing down the fort. That, my friends, is it for us on the day. Now we are going over to watchingthewatchers.locals.com to get into it again. We hope to see you there, but if not, that's all right. We're gonna be back here on Monday to get into it again. We're gonna have a lot of stuff to get to. As you can see, we've got the gag order filing. Jack Smith also responded to Trump's immunity claim in the J6 case, and so that's gonna be hot and cooking. We're gonna have the speaker battle to attend to. And if I had to guess, something else is probably going to happen over the weekend that we're going to have to talk about and unpack here. And so, until we come back here to do it again, I do hope you have yourselves an incredible weekend. I know we spend a lot of time on some heavy stuff during the week. So, if at all possible, let's get outside. Get some sunshine. Get some fresh air. Get some vitamin D. Spend time with our friends, our families, the people that we love. And recharge our batteries because, man... We're just getting started and we're going to come back here next week and we need to be refreshed and rejuvenated because we're going to be back here and we need your help so that together we can shine that big, beautiful 
spotlight of accountability and transparency down upon our system with the hope of finding justice. Make it a beautiful night, my friends. Sleep very well. I'll see you right back here on Monday. Bye-bye. Thank you.